We're recording and we're starting. Thank you, Mark. Welcome everyone. This is the meeting of the Mayor and Council of Princeton, March 22nd, 2021. I ask the, uh, the clerk to read the uh, statement concerning notice of meeting. Notice of this meeting was provided in accordance with the requirements of the Open Public Meetings Act and state regulations governing remote public meetings, including the time, date, and location of the meeting and clear and concise instructions to the public for accessing the meeting and making comments. In addition, the agenda and all related materials were posted electronically and made available to the public on Princeton's meeting portal in advance of the meeting. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Sure. Ms. Perone Lambros? Should be a few minutes late. Okay. Ms. Niedergang? I'm here, thank you. Mr. Cohen? Here. Ms. Braga? Here. Mr. Williamson? Here. Ms. Sachs? Here. Mayor Frieda? Here. Thank you. A, a couple things real quick. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome Bob Brushai uh, back, so to speak, as our, uh, he's going to be our interim administrator. Uh, Mr. DeShield will be leaving us very soon in about 10 days. Uh, and Bob will fill in until the new administrator is selected and is able to, to start. So welcome, Bob. Uh, I'd also like to announce that Ordinance 20, 2105 uh, will now have its public hearing instead of tonight on April 12th. And then it'll be on, uh, it'll actually be on the planning board agenda on April 1st. Uh, this change is to allow the planning board to complete its master plan consistency review of the ordinance and give a report to council before council uh, handles that matter. Also, ordinance 2021-08 is being removed from tonight's agenda. It's a salary and compensation ordinance uh, just because the wrong copy of the ordinance was attached to the agenda. So we'll uh, put the correct copy at a, uh, the correct form of that at a future meeting and handle it then. Okay, so we can go into announcements. Uh, council members have announcements or reports they wish to make. Uh, Leticia. Thank you, Mayor. Just one quick announcement. Uh, and this follows your uh, reminder that uh, our administrator is retiring at the end of this month. Uh, and my announcement is that on Tuesday, March 30th, Starting at 7 p.m., uh, we're going to host a farewell uh, and also an opportunity to express our well wishes to Mr. DeShield. Uh, the meeting uh, is this is going to be a virtual uh, farewell, and the meeting link will be on the municipal calendar. But welcome everyone uh, who's listening and also share with others uh, to join us on that day, uh, March 30th. Again, Tuesday, 7 p.m. And following that, uh, is, uh, we're actually scheduled to meet with uh, University, uh, Princeton University President Ice Gruber uh, starting at 7.45. Thank you. Thank you, Leticia. Eve, you were next. Uh, I also have a follow-up to uh, the mayor's announcement, which is that we will be, uh, we've continued uh, with the administrator search for a permanent administrator. And uh, we have interviews with two candidates uh, this coming week. We're hoping that they will, uh, we will have the wonderful uh, uh, situation of having a hard time deciding. Um, but hopefully, uh, you know, by the end of the week, I hope I'm not uh, jinxing it, we'll, we'll uh, or very soon after, we'll know uh, who our uh, next administrator will be. And, uh, Thank you for uh, to Bob for uh, stepping in and to Mark for the many many years of service. So. Thank you, Eve. Uh, Dwayne, Dwayne, then David, then Mia. Okay, I have uh, some announcements about some great things going on over at uh, Princeton Recreation. Uh, first, uh, uh, they're announcing their uh, spring basketball clinics, which are starting uh, pretty soon. Um, if uh, those were these are for. Um, the, the boys basketball clinics will be at Grover Park Court for fourth to ninth graders. The clinic dates are starting actually on uh, the 23rd. So you're talking about tomorrow. And uh, the girls basketball clinics at Grover Park, also for fourth to ninth graders, uh, will start on April 12th. 
So um, they are open to Princeton residents, Cranberry residents, and non-residents who attend schools in Princeton. So uh, if space allows, they will also be open to Princeton non-residents. Uh, you can register at PrincetonRecreation.com. And now some, uh, some uh, major announcements about uh, plans for the summer from Princeton Recreation. Uh, just wanna, and this may take a while because there's quite a few things that are really important in here. Um, just wanna update everyone on the uh, recreation's plans for summer 2021 for the youth and teen programming. Uh, while it feels like progress is being made slowly in the fight against COVID-19, there are still plenty of challenges as it relates to activities that bring large groups of uh, people and particularly the kids together. So, um, uh, of course, we see what's going on with some of the concerns over at, uh, at Princeton Public Schools. So the whole situation remains pretty complicated. That said, uh, recreation are constantly communicating with our local health department about these challenges and also interfacing with the state department of health, health to, to clarify you know, what can be done and what can be done. So as it relates to our local recreation department, they have decided that they will not be running our traditional day camp and teen travel camp for 2021. Of course, the logistics of a full day camp program are complicated in general. And um, I'm just trying to, I'm gonna cut this down because there's quite a few things in here. And of course, you know, it gets really difficult if you have inclement weather, like where do you put the kids and do you have space to keep so many kids in, in a close, uh, or so many students in, uh, in close proximity, et cetera. So the good news though, is that uh, recreation is, are putting the finishing touches on a menu of programs and activities for all ages that uh, they are really excited about. Uh, most of the programs will be offered as half-day programs, some in the morning and some in the afternoon, uh, in the evenings or, or weekend. Um, they are planning to pretty much blanket the summer weeks with as many different types of activities as possible for as many age groups as possible. And for a wide variety of sport programs. And regarding community park pool, when, when we get more information about that, then I will we'll be sure to announce those. And the last thing, of course, the, uh, the elephant in the room with recreation is Hilltop Park. Um, just want to let uh, the public know that um, I know my, my colleagues here on council, mayor and council, and of course, the recreation department, et cetera, has been getting a whole lot of e uh, uh, emails and we're seeing also um, opinions being written in, in the local papers, uh, many in support of the, uh, the turf field, the soccer turf field, many against the soccer turf field. The main point I wanna make about those is, that we're, those is that we're taking everyone's concerns very seriously and whatever the outcome is gonna be, it's going to involve uh, definitely uh, uh, the different opinions and, 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 and points made by the uh, Princeton public and what's in the best interest of the town as a whole. So um, I understand, and Eve, you may touch on this, uh, that um, the meeting initially scheduled for this week, the joint meeting uh, among recreation, engineering, and PEC is going to be rescheduled. That's information I, I got recently. And of course, we're, and you're, you'll, you'll touch on that. And so um, 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 stay tuned. Thank you. Okay, if we can, uh, Eve, can we just All right, through? very, very quick. I, I'm really glad you reminded me of that, uh, Dwayne. Uh, yes, the, uh, the joint uh, meeting between REC and the Environmental Commission that was scheduled to be held on Thursday has been postponed. It'll be held in mid-April and we'll get you that date. Uh, the Environmental Commission is still meeting tomorrow on Wednesday with Hilltop uh, environmental concerns about Hilltop on the agenda and someone from the rec department and engineering will be there. So please, if you're interested in the topic, uh, you know, join us and make your opinion heard. So thanks for that reminder, Dwayne. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, David. You, and then, I'm sorry, Dwayne, yeah. are, you done? are you done? Yeah, no, I'm done, Mayor. Thanks. Okay, David and then Mia. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly mention that on Thursday morning at 9 a.m., there is a meeting of the per permit parking task force. It's a working session, but it will be open to the public for those who are interested. Thank you, Mia. Yeah, I just want to give an update on the open space manager position. Um, we are reviewing the applications and we'll be starting interviews soon. So we're, we hope to look forward soon, not only to a new administrator, but 
finally, after many years, a full-time open space manager position. And uh, so we're really excited about that. Thank you. Any other Wait. council announcements or reports before we move to staff? Okay. Um, why don't we do the two uh, police reports and then we'll move to other staff reports. Hello, Mayor. Hello, Council. It's good to see everyone. I hope everybody's well. Uh, as you know, Chief uh, Morgan uh, prepared uh, two monthly reports uh, for, for this uh, Council session. Uh, typically, we do one, but uh, you know, based on the timing of it all uh, and the way that it worked out, um, we have uh, January and February uh, ready for, uh, for tonight so that we can uh, keep up to date. Um, in going through the reports, uh, I think you'll see that the generated calls uh, have uh, remained um, largely inconsistent, likely due to the uh, COVID virus and some of the uh, operational changes that we've made um, as a department in response to the virus. Um, that being said, uh, we are currently in the uh, beginning stages, um, or you know, maybe even a little bit more advanced in the beginning, uh, in phasing back to normal. So uh, many of our units, um, specialized units and the command staff are already phasing back to normal where we're working uh, more regularly uh, and, and not on a hybrid schedule, so to speak. Um, and the patrol bureau, uh, which is the bulk of the department will be, will be following. And I think a uh, reasonable expectation would be that uh, early April uh, we'll be back to full strength. Um, and with those changes, uh, I think we could forecast uh, an uptick in a lot of the generated calls, um, a lot of the activity that we generate as a department um, will we'll start to go back to normal. Uh, maybe not in the, uh, in the March report, um, uh, but certainly April and beyond. Um, in addition to, uh, uh, to that, um, I'd be uh, remiss not to mention that once we do begin to phase back to normal, uh, and begin enforcement um, and a lot of our uh, outreach in the community, which is uh, part of our strategic plan, uh, we're gonna leverage social media to let everybody know, uh, specifically the, the, community, the community about um, what to expect, what we're doing day to day. Uh, there certainly will be no surprises. Uh, this has been a long, uh, a long transition, uh, almost a year. So uh, we will, uh, uh, certainly keep the community informed uh, about everything that we're doing day to day. Um, in addition to that, just an update on our, our uh, hiring process. Uh, we are, it's a, uh, as you know, it's a rolling uh, process. Uh, and I, I can uh, let you know that uh, we've begun the uh, background phase uh, of investigations for uh, a group of candidates uh, that have made it um, uh, to, to that portion of, of the process. And we're extremely excited about the uh, uh, talented, uh, diverse uh, pool of candidates that we've been able to um, interview and, uh, and get to know the, thus far. So, so that's really, really exciting news. Um, let's see, uh, uh, obviously the, uh, the cannabis uh, task force um, and the uh, uh, news that came out about that, we're excited about that as the police department uh, our Safe Neighborhood Bureau, uh, specifically uh, Patrolman Navas uh, and the Sergeant in that Bureau, Tom Lagomarsino, uh, they're gonna be uh, involved in that. And uh, as, as a department, we're excited to, uh, to work with that, with that group um, as it relates to the new, new, new marijuana legislation. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, uh, that's a, about, um, as much uh, as, as I can tell you so far, these, these changes operationally are going to be very big for us, uh, getting back to normal. Uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, with the community. Uh, one of our main goals in the strategic plan is to uh, you know, inject ourselves uh, to, to a large degree into the community when, when we can, when, when, uh, when, it per, when COVID permits, um, and get back out. Uh, and do a lot with the community. So uh, a huge emphasis in, in our meetings uh, administratively 
uh, have been, you know, related to how we can best do that and, and use our social media platform to, uh, to promote it. John, thank you very much. Are there any council questions uh, for the captain? David and then uh, Eve? Yeah, <clears throat> I just want to make a request. Um, just the previous year and this year for these reports was fine since COVID didn't really get going until March. But I'd like to request that for future reports this year, if we could do a two year look back and see 2019 as well as 2020, because this, you know, last year's um, numbers are so out of whack, I think it'll be helpful for us to understand this year's numbers if we can see two years back. Yeah, I, I think that's totally fair. And um, one of the first things we did uh, after Chief Sutter uh, retired, um, Chief Morgan organized uh, you know, a group where we brainstormed and came up with a strategic plan. And uh, you know, one, of those, uh, one of those goals was to uh, review and revamp our monthly and annual reports. So I think that's a great idea. Um, certainly 2020, there's not a lot of uh, information to glean from. So I think it's a great, I'll bring that to the chief's attention and I absolutely uh, support the idea. I think it's a great idea. Thanks. Eve. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, John. Um, so I have a question, not surprisingly, about, about cannabis. Um, when we last talked about this, I think it was before, the, or maybe right after the new legislation had been passed. And I'm wondering, uh, what the police department is is doing in in terms of outreach to let let people know what what to expect and what or to the extent that you know that the uh, attorney general has let you know like what what the rules are um, in, in terms of uh, public use of uh, of cannabis like is there anything that you're doing on social media to explain to people what's permitted, what isn't permitted? Right, so um, the, uh, the plan is to certainly share uh, as much of that information uh, and aggressively put it out um, to educate and inform. Um, but so much of it has come out so quickly uh, that uh, I, I don't wanna say we're waiting, um, but, but we're, uh, we're being patient uh, as to you know what else is going to come out, maybe what changes, uh, so on and so forth. But um, I think that once we have a firm understanding uh, of, uh, and, and we do, believe it or not, we're, we're training um, our officers day to day on, on all the changes. Um, but I forecast there's going to be some additional uh, changes. Um, and, and when we feel comfortable that that's occurred, we're going to share it immediately um, and, and do an education campaign, so to speak. Uh, to uh, make sure that the community is well aware of, uh, of the new law uh, and, and how it relates to us and uh, expectations, so on and so forth. Okay, that's excellent. I'm not, I'm not trying to push you before you're, uh, you're ready. I did notice in the, in the police reports that in January, there was one cannabis arrest and February none, which is good because, you know, given the change in the law, but I'm wondering, uh, is there any kind of policy that you're you're following until kind of the official policy is in is in place? Um, yes, so I, we're taking our lead from the um, county prosecutor's office, uh, who's who's getting all that information uh, from the attorney general, and it, and it filters down through the county and to us. Um, but we're, we're absolutely cognizant of the changes uh, that have been made. Um, it's been made very clear to our officers, the spirit of the legislation uh, and how it relates to law enforcement and, uh, and the expectations have been made uh, to our people. Um, if, that, if, if, if that helps. That's, yeah, that, that's important. And also, of course, yeah. for, the, for the protection of the police department as well, given the, the changes in the in the laws, we don't want uh, anybody to, you know, have a, any police officers to have a negative experience with that either. So, yeah. I just wanted to add to it to to to, to the answer. Um, so it wasn't a separate uh, comment that I wanted to make. Just wanted the mayor to know that. So I didn't want to seem like I was jumping ahead of Leticia who had her hand up. Okay. Um, just just a couple, uh, just two major uh, points I think that should be mentioned here is um, one is that. <clears throat> 
all open misdemeanor marijuana cases, uh, we got a directive from the attorney general's office uh, to uh, dismiss all of them. So every case, every misdemeanor marijuana possession case pretty much just got dismissed. Uh, a, a major issue that's affecting the police is that um, there was so much pushback about the uh, not informing parents when minors are caught uh, with marijuana or cannabis, which is kind of interesting because it's, it's some of the writings. When it's legal, you're supposed to use the word cannabis. Where it's illegal, it's still supposed to use the word marijuana, which right. I find really interesting. But anyway, um, so, uh, so under the current new law, if a minor is caught with marijuana, the police are actually prohibited from informing the parents, which got a lot of pushback from the police. And in fact, there's, there are other issues about the police even approaching uh, um, uh, some prohibitions against the police and approaching people, uh, young people they suspect of smoking marijuana. Um, there's been so much pushback about those that uh, at least the part about informing the parents is actually uh, going back to the le legislature now for reconsideration. So there's probably going to be some new legislation coming out where the police will be allowed to inform parents on a first time use. The current new law is you can only inform the parents for a second time the police bust a person for lack of a better word for or, or minor or uh, for having marijuana. So the, the bottom line is this is evolving. There's so many new parts to it. And, it, and, and because it's so new and, 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 and so significant a change, uh, you, we're going to see these, this evolution, which affects, of course, policing, affects the courts, affects the lawyers, et cetera. Leticia. Yes, uh, thank you. And mine is also not so much of a question, but a comment. Uh, so I, re I did report at our last meeting that the Youth Advisory Committee uh, held a community dialogue in collaboration with the police department, which uh, the officers did a, a really phenomenal job connecting, not just with our youth, we also have several adults that participated in the dialogue. And obviously that was one of the big questions. What, what will that law mean for us? Uh, and I think there's still going to be questions just as you're indicated that you're still uh, uh, finding out, you know, getting uh, the director from the attorney generals, including you know, we know uh, as far as not informing parents, if, if someone, if, if a minor is stopped, but what about if it happens in the school setting? You know, I imagine that the schools will still have the policies that they follow. Uh, and so, you know, I know that's, that's going to come up, but I, I expect it's something that the cannabis task force uh, is also going to uh, make sure that we're kept that ourselves were well educate ourselves and are well informed so that when we do educational outreach, hope we'll, hopefully we'll have some of those answers. And, and uh, to that end, uh, actually Officer Navas, uh, on tonight's agenda, there's a resolution appointing her as the public safety liaison to the cannabis task force. No, actually, she's already been appointed to the Cannabis Task Force. Tonight's agenda is a point officially appointing her uh, to the Youth Advisory uh, Committee as an official uh, liaison to from public safety. But uh, so the other, my comment that I was going to make is, you know, we have the Youth Advisory, we have civil rights, we have human services, and many other boards, commissions, and committees that I would encourage you uh, to to use uh, in, uh, in order to do more outreach. Once you have uh, more information, you know, make use of us in order to, uh, to do community outreach and, and provide, uh, provide that education. I think that's a great idea, uh, Leticia, and I, I, certainly, uh, I certainly will bring that uh, back to the administration, support it 100% and agree with it. Thank you. Any other questions on the police reports? Okay, great. Do we have other staff reports this evening? John. Mr. Brushon. You're muted, Bob. There we are. Um, just one real quick question, just of clarification. Um, on Wednesday evening, the, at the PEC meeting, 
recreation is not going to go and make their presentation. Is that correct? I mean, that's what that's what staff would like to do. And I, I thought that's what uh, Mr. Williamson had said. But I'm just mm. I, I walked, you know, I was uh, dabbling with the computer here and I just want to be sure. Um, I'll, recreation will not. Like to do. I'll defer to Deanna, but my understanding is that Evan and Deanna would be at uh, the Environmental Commission on Wednesday night to uh to talk about hilltop deanna okay that, well here, here's what we we met this a joint meeting with me was mean, scheduled that's a little confusing it, it's not a joint meeting it's just a presentation from the rec board to but i think there i don't think there were enough people present to make it to notice it well what we what we would prefer to do at the staff level is just push that off until we can get a better handle on all of the other information that's coming uh, from the public and so forth. We just don't feel that, with, that to go in and just make a, um, you know, a presentation is going to value the project at this juncture. Um, so if it's, if it's okay with the council, we would just as soon hold off, let the PEC have, they have a big hearing that night, I believe, or a big meeting with the university anyway. Let them deal with that. Let us regroup at the staff level. Um, and then we'll uh, schedule it for, you know, at, at, an, at a more appropriate time to go before the BEC. Bob, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I, actually, I thought that's what was happening. Uh, what Eve's saying is sort of like a joint meeting light, but I thought there'll be no joint meeting at all. Um, so what I'm, I'm concerned about is that um, there, there needs to be uh, a forum for the public to express their concerns about this to the relevant people and originally there were two meetings scheduled for this week one PEC in which this was on the agenda and the rec department was going to be making a presentation and the environmental commission was going to be responding and then number two was supposed to be a special meeting of the rec board and the environmental commission together which was noticed and everyone was holding it on their calendar and that was canceled um and now the other opportunity in which there could be discussion of this issue is now also being canceled. So I don't think that it's necessary for the for the rec um, for staff to make a presentation. But I know that environmental commission members have their own presentation on this that they wanted the rec um, uh, rec commission. Uh, rec staff to hear, as well as the commission the following night. So however it all works out, there need to be um, opportunities for the rec staff and board members to hear from the environmental commission members and the public. And there need to be opportunities for the environmental commission members to hear from staff and the rec um, the rec commission and from the public. And my concern is that in one week, we are now all of a sudden eliminating all opportunities for this, these various channels of communication to take place. No, yeah, I respectfully I disagree. Um, there are two sets of things going on here. The public is always invited to rec meetings and, I, and I'm sure it's the same for PEC, et cetera. So they could always uh, present uh, you know, we also have uh, time for um, presentations uh, uh, from the public. So whatever concerns they want to present, they can, they're, they're welcome to come to our meeting on Thursday night and, and present uh, whatever they want to present, as people have been doing regarding Hilltop. And we have uh, members of, of course, uh, we have the executive director from staff who's also on the board, uh, Ben Stentz there, Evan Moorhead, you have the recreation board, and they're there answering questions. We've been doing that. And I've been doing that as, the, as council liaison. As far as having a joint presentation, the only thing that's been rescheduled that would have been this week is that joint presentation. And we just want to make sure that, uh, uh, because this is such an important issue, um, as, as Bob said, we just want to make sure, and I'm sure Bob can also speak for himself on it, we want to make sure that when we do make that presentation is after we've basically investigated all the things needed to be investigated uh, on the side of recreation, on engineering, et cetera, and then we will make such a presentation. But the, the, but the public is always welcome at recreation uh, board meetings um, to express their views. Okay, David's had his hand up. Let's get to, let's get to David, and then we'll get to everyone. David? Thanks, Mark. Um, my concern, and I was just hearing what Mia was saying about a third meeting, which was an opportunity for the public to weigh in, also being canceled. Was that the planning board 
concept or a courtesy review? Is that what you were referring to, Mia? No, I didn't mention a third meeting. It was it was just the, those two meetings. And well, I, I do want to raise a concern that we're scheduled on April 1st for the planning board to hear. No, David, that, that's no longer on that that was removed. I, I'm that was that's no longer on April 1st because the other item for April 1st was considered we got we got an email already that that is no longer on because the other item is going to be too long is that the uh the area in need presentation yes yeah so we we already heard at the end of last week that it was not on for april 1st so i just want to add before i don't know if you has her hand up but this is uh, um this is just uh, continuing what i said to me but i do Thank you, Mia. She, she makes an excellent point. I mean, the, the bottom line is, as I said in, in my announcements earlier, is that we are very open to hearing all the views of the public regarding Hilltop Park. There's, I don't want to make it some things were decided already, but that being said, that does not mean we're going to shut out the public. I know uh, Ben and Evan from uh, the Recreation Board have been meeting uh, with members of the uh, local homeowners, uh, homeowners association and different members of the public about Hilltop Park and that's continuing. So, so thank you, Mia, for bringing up the, the, the point that, you know, that, that the public needs to be heard and we're, we're addressing that. And not just okay. the public, but also the staff and, you know, with just the dialogue from everybody hearing everyone. That's going However on However that works. So I, I just want to make the point okay. that I was, that I was trying to make, which is that PEC should have a presentation on this before the planning board does their courtesy review because yes. that's the regular order of business. PEC reviews projects and they make recommendations to the planning board. So I just want to make sure that that order is followed whenever each of those presentations happens. Yes. Eve, thank you for being patient. Sorry, but <laughs> um, I'm a little conflicted about this because PC is event has essentially cleared their calendar. They have one other thing on the agenda and that's it. And they've cleared their calendar to have this uh, discussion and it's too late to really make, you know, the, those changes. Um, and I think even if there's not a formal presentation by Rec uh, and engineering, I think it would be useful, and I'm fine giving that up, but I think it would be useful to have rec and engineering at our meeting, at the PEC meeting, to be able to answer questions and have a dialogue with some of the PEC members that have now done, as Mia mentioned, a tremendous amount of work to try to engage with the uh, the uh, proposal and and you know maybe that proposal is going to be changed in some ways but there are still things about for example artificial turf or lights that will be the same even if they're as long as you're using those two things some there are some concerns and issues that will be the same so I'm I'm speaking for PEC here and I don't really have authority to do that but I I, I would say that to pull that to have members of the public come. You know, some of whom are here tonight listening, but some of whom are not and have this on their calendar. It's just very short notice. So I, I would really request that, you know, Evan and, and Deanna, if at all possible, attend even just to be there to hear community concerns and to answer questions, both from rec department and uh, from the public. But, uh, you know, again, I, I don't, I'm happy, it's fine if there's no presentation. But I think that the opportunity for dialogue is is important. Hey, Bob. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about that tomorrow at the at the, at the on the staff level, even. I'm, and I'm, I'm you know I understand exactly what all the council members are saying. It's just that there have been so many public discussions. We wanted the opportunity to kind of regroup ourselves and try to be able to be. Um, you know, to be in a position where we can answer a majority of any questions. So if it's a go and listen session and we can get the questions from PEC, you know, maybe we can certainly, um, you know, take that take that approach so that they can have their uh, questions formally asked with with the, uh, you know, uh, knowledge that they may not be fully answered that that evening. Yeah, I don't I don't think you need to have answers. 
But I think listening and taking notes, if that's all that's done, that would be helpful that there's a sense that the decision makers are, are being reached. Okay, or, well, we'll, we'll um, uh, Evan and uh, Deanna and I will uh, huddle up tomorrow morning and, and see the best way to handle that one. All um, right. Which, which, which discussion, which public, um, you said there've been a lot of discussions with which public? Well, I'm talking about in in the pub, in the public. I mean, there haven't been. We need to have public discussions. There are going to be several of them before we get a, an authorization. I would assume to proceed with the project, because okay. that will that will fall on the laps of the governing body at some point. Um, but but with all of that, all of the mm -hmm. information that's been published in the newspapers, the letters to the editor, the uh, you know, just the the public participation. We want to be able to answer all of those questions um, to the satisfaction of everyone and then get a no-go or a go, hopefully, uh, that this project could be uh, moved forward. Because I know the governing body obviously has put a great deal of time in on this, as the staff has. And um, it just seems that uh, every time we get close to um, the go date, it, it, it just kind of gets stalled a little. And we, we'd like to know that we're going to be able to move forward with the project um, or not move forward with the project so that we so, can. So well, let me just say, it seems to me that, you know, we've put forth an idea. The public knows about the meeting on Wednesday evening. So the public should still attend the meeting on, on Wednesday evening. We should have staff there to listen to what all the questions are. So we're sure that we know what all the questions are so we can prepare answers for all the questions instead of trying to, to present something that might be appeared to be half-baked. So let's get all the questions Let's figure out how to answer them. And then we'll just have to make sure we coordinate that the, when this is on the planning board agenda, that is not that doesn't happen until we've had a chance to have a public um, share with the public answers to all the questions that come up Wednesday evening. So I think that should be the goal. And, and come before PEC as you know, a courtesy review um, yep. in, as we've agreed that municipal projects should. Yep. Okay. Um, are there other staff reports? Okay. We'll move on from reports and announcements and let's go into presentations. Uh, the first presentation is from the Arts Council about a possible Bloomberg grant. We know who from. We think we need to bring council is presenting. Adam Welch. You need to bring Adam Welch up, or let me just. I don't. Let me. I don't. Or Caroline Cleves. Um, let me find. I think Caroline. Yeah, Caroline. She's got her hand up. Yeah, I think Caroline Cleves. If you could bring her over, thank you. Hello. Can hey, you Caroline. hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm, um, Adam had to go to another uh, meeting. So um, I'll be presenting on behalf of the Arts Council and, and Maria Evans is also on the call with me. Um, and you can unmute her if you have questions for her. Um, in lieu of a presentation, I know everybody on the council has very good um, imagination. So I'll just leave it to your imaginations to <laughs> come along with me as I explain to you this opportunity. Um, Grant, uh, Bloomberg uh, Philanthropies hosts an annual um, asphalt art initiative grant program that's distributed to roughly 20 municipalities a year. And um, it's designed to fund visual art interventions on roadways, pedestrian surfaces, and public infrastructure. Um, it's got three main goals, uh, one of which is improving street and pedestrian safety, which um, the Bloomberg data people have identified as um, enhancing public safety and pedestrian safety, especially in crosswalks, um, revitalizing and um, activating underutilized public spaces as a second goal of the project. And the third is to promote collaboration and civic engagement in local um, communities. Um, we thought it was an interesting opportunity to present it to the municipality given um, your plans to um, rejuvenate the Witherspoon Street corridor. Uh, it's a $25,000 uh, opportunity. Um, so it, it's a nice, it, you know, it would be an opportunity to have some outside funding to help 
with the kind of aesthetic considerations that you might want to incorporate into this corridor. It's also because it's asphalt art, it's by its very nature, very temporary. So it's not a permanent piece of public art. It would be um, something that would, uh, that could stay on, on uh, the sidewalks or the crosswalks for as long as people saw fit, and then it could be replaced by something else. Um, so our proposal to you, well, our questions are twofold. And one is, is there generally an interest in um, coming on board as the municipal sponsor of a grant application where we to submit it? And um, two, um, I guess that's really the primary, que the primary question we had tonight is if you would be interested in our taking, taking the time to submit the application on behalf of the municipality. Um, and I should say, um, by, by way of kind of qualifying it, we, while we have some design ideas that we would come up with, we don't necessarily need to have the design ideas in place at the time we apply. Um, for instance, there's a, a community in Indiana that just got the grant and the way that they structured it was that uh, their application involved a call for artists. So they didn't have a design in mind when they submitted the application, but they made a strong case for, for uh, the grant insofar as it was, it was embedded in a larger uh, municipal development project. Um, we also have, of course, the public art committee, which is part of the municipal government, right, in part, um, that could have helped oversee the design and implementation, but um, we would be looking for the, the municipality of Princeton to act as our municipal co-sponsor and we would be the fiscal agent for the, the exercising of the grant. Michelle. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Caroline. I'm, and my apologies, I don't know if you had something you wanted to present to us. We should have had you come over as a panelist. Um, That's fine. Anyway, my, but that we can do that in the future. So uh, the bottom line right now, I just want to summarize for my colleagues and every, the public is that the request is, is the municipality interested in, in, in partnering with the Arts Council um, to move forward to do the grant application and the Arts Council would be doing the grant writing and would be the primary interface. And then once the approved grant comes through, then you would then come back with various art projects that the council and our art review committee could take a look at and and, and decide on what would work best. Is, is that, uh, I just that's, want to summarize. That's a good summary. That's right. And we could be working in, in you know, a lot in, in the meantime on developing different ideas for crosswalks, especially as something that's small and discreet and completely doable. Eve? Okay. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> I didn't realize you could see me. That was a little shocking. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Hi, Caroline. Um, I'm still not 100% sure. Are we just going to, you're just looking for us to agree in theory that we should apply for this grant? I'm wondering what kind of specifically what kind of municipal resources you need if, if the Arts Council is writing the grant and it's just our name. I, I can't imagine anyone would object. I certainly wouldn't, but I'm just curious if there are other municipal resources that you need uh, to move forward. And I'm not clear on that. Right, okay, um, let me be clear. So uh, we would be writing the application and submitting everything on behalf of the municipality. What we would probably need is some sort of letter attesting to the fact that in principle, the, the municipality was interested in pursuing this opportunity. We, we already have the plans for the Witherspoon Street redevelopment that we could submit alongside that. So there's really, there's no cost to you in terms of personnel time or other requirements. And you have my support. <laughs> David? <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to um, sort of pick Deanna's brain for a minute because I worked tangentially on this with Ms. Lampert a year or two ago, this, this same grant opportunity came up. And I remember at that time, we had a hard time finding a good location for it. Deanna, can you refresh a little bit? And, and it's definitely gonna involve staff time if we do it, because you know 
engineering has to be involved with uh, any any pavement markings that happen. Yes, uh, thank you, David. Um, so previously engineering and planning had been involved in the last round of these grant applications and I forwarded on that the same information uh, that we'd come up with at that time that we would support um, an art installation, but we have a lot of concerns about how it um, is placed in the roadway because there are very clear national standards regarding colors in um, the roadway. And so we, we have talked about other opportunities such as um, putting something on the traffic signal box Mm -hmm. or, or some other um, infrastructure in the area that can um, receive artwork instead. The, the, absolutely, and, and, and boxes, uh, the utility boxes and the signal boxes are also indicated in previous applications as perfectly suitable. Um, Trenton just got a grant for this last year and they in fact did a large intersection and crosswalk and we weren't thinking necessarily of an intersection but um uh, my my i imagine that they adhered to whatever the state requirements were for colors in the in that area it's what's interesting um deanna is that with this new iteration of the bloomberg opportunity came a uh traffic study and, and, and safety report that's um, I'd like to share with all of you because that they've got a lot of data behind pedestrianized walkways being made safer with more graphic detail, but I can't share that with you right now because I wasn't expecting to be here. <laughs> Leticia? Leticia. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, I, I too, I, I think this is a really, uh, I, I support the idea and the concept and you know, and the fact that we were not being asked to provide funding for it is, is even better. Uh, but uh, one thing that I would uh, suggest is uh, to, and I know that uh, Arts Council does this uh, generally, but suggest that if it's something that's going, especially public art and in that neighborhood or any neighborhood mm -hmm. that uh, use uh, solicit public input uh, of, as to what's going to go in in there, uh, that's right. Yes, and I know uh, when I when I first served uh, my first year on council, I actually served on the uh, public arts review committee, and I know there were many several uh, suggestions that were proposed for public art that sounded really good, but we were being asked to pay for it. So the fact that uh, you know there are some ideas out there already uh, for public art that I think would be great. Uh, but you know, definitely would love uh, for us to take the opportunity, take advantage of this grant. Uh, you know, provided uh, provided again that we can get solicit input from the community and from. I, I really, I really appreciate you saying that, and and certainly um, because it would also involve historical districts as yes. well. There, are, there are a series of review panels as well as obviously public. We we convened quite a number of public uh, comment opportunities for the, the mural on John Street and and those are always so productive. So of course everything would be vetted through both the appropriate municipal committees and then the public as well. So we end up with something that is delightful and agreed upon and enhances everybody's sense of belonging to a place. Sounds great, thank you. Are there any other council questions on this? Uh, Caroline, do we need to invite Maria in? To, does she have comments, Maria Evans, that needs to be made? Or um, you might you might open her up and see if she's got anything to add. <laughs> I don't. I can't speak for her. She's as surprised as I am to be here tonight. So um, you, she might have something really interesting to add. Okay. Maria, if you have anything to add, you could unmute yourself and jump in. Or... Everybody, I, I, I don't have a lot to add. I know that um, I've seen some of the crosswalks and intersections painted. And um, of course, I myself, I uh, would love to do the one connecting the library and the Arts Council, the, the crosswalks there. But I too was in a meeting a couple years ago with Liz Lempert when we were talking about this. And 
there were a lot of unknowns then. And I do know that a lot of cities have done this work and have had great success with it. And one of the um, great things involved in it is when the community gets on board for the whole project, every lots of people are in the street with these long rollers and painting together. And um, I, I think I think it would be done well. I think I think we would take our time getting a great design. And um, I only I only think it could add to to Princeton. So that's all I really have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Okay, if there's no further council questions, I think we should at least, for the record, have a motion that we agreed that the uh, Arts Council can file for this and that we'd be a partner with that. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion. A second. Do you see a seconded? All in favor of the motion, could you please raise your hand or say yes so we know that we have? Okay. Yes. Okay, that's, that's everyone on council uh, voted in the affirmative. So, uh, Caroline and Maria, you're you're good to move ahead with the. Uh... Thank you so much, everybody. We're, we're not going to let you down on this one. Thank you. Yes, thank, you. thank you so much. Okay. Um, next presentation is on the library budget. Who is uh, presenting that? But, you know, Jennifer Podowski and. Yeah, that would be Jennifer. I saw her in the audience. I don't. And Michelle. I think Susan Chernick is on too. Okay. Hi, it's Jennifer. I'm here, but I don't see an um, an audio. I mean, a, vi a video option. One, hold on one second. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring okay. it. Thanks, Mark. I would suggest that in the future, like Michelle said, if we have someone presenting, they could be invited as a panelist. So noted. Yeah, we do that on the planning board. It works well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm here. We just need Susan Chernick. Hello. Did you? Hold on. That's the Oh, um, I just need to be able to share my screen. Be able to do it now. How's that? Did it work? Yes, it did. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Podolsky, the executive director of the Princeton Public Library. It's strange I have to actually introduce myself to a few of you. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you tonight. I regret that I've yet to meet some of you in person. Um, as some of you know, I was on the job only 33 days when the world changed. So I'm really grateful to be with you, even if it's just virtually, to discuss the work of the library. 2020 certainly was an unprecedented year for all of us. We had to close the doors of the Sands Library building when the pandemic hit, but all of our staff continued to work. In a lot of ways, as great as our building is, during the pandemic, more people came to appreciate that the library is more than just a building. It's about staff providing resources so that everyone in the community can have the means by which to reach their full potential. Here are just a few of the reasons why I was so proud of our performance during 2020. We met uncertain times with unprecedented services. After we closed, we quickly pivoted to a full-time, full-service virtual library. We continued to answer questions and assist in research. We redesigned our website twice to spotlight digital resources. And we also helped people adapt to using those digital resources. Our lending staff made check-in calls with regular customers and started Storyline, which is a popular call-in program. 
One of our big shared accomplishments was the PrincetonCOVID.org website, which provided official information in the crucial early days of the pandemic. In addition to the vetted health information, we played a big early role in letting people know what was open, how people could get help or give help. We started a community-wide virtual calendar of events to support local organizations that were new to the world of online programming. COVID site is still being updated twice a week with information on cases, vaccination, and testing. While we were planning for phase reopening, we knew there are people in the community who rely on the library for high-speed internet. So we expanded our Wi-Fi coverage to all of Heinz Plaza, creating an outdoor workspace and supporting the diners and other visitors to town. We also piloted a mobile hotspot lending program, which we're expanding on this year. Our free programs went online, everything from story times to bait for babies and author programs such as Maria Inahosa and Nicholas Kristoff. Two of our signature programs, the Environmental Film Festival and Children's Book Festival were changed to virtual events. Both events were usually successful. We did all of this while under a spending freeze and a hiring freeze. We redoubled our efforts to raise private funds and had successful campaigns for Library Giving Day and our fall annual appeal. As you can see, the use of our eBooks and digital audiobooks went up substantially. And while we have a wide variety of digital resources, they're not free. You'll notice that the cost of an average eBook is roughly more than three times higher than the cost of an average print book. And although Princeton is still very much a book town, we expect our digital resources to continue to be really popular. Demand for our learning and career tools went up this past year too. That three month comparison of participation in online courses like lynda.com and the great courses is pretty startling. More students and their parents turned to our BrainFuse learning suite which features online one-to-one -one tutoring, which usage went up almost 200%. Use of our research databases went up by more than 100%. And the number of people attending programs for job seekers went up 90%. You'll hear from Finance Director Susan Chernick in just a few minutes, but I want to give you a brief overview of our funding. Princeton Public Library's budget is unusual in that we receive both great public support and substantial private support. Our private support is the result of two decades of hard work to raise funds in the community and secure additional outside funding. We have three major funding sources, as you can see illustrated here on our three-legged stool. The first leg is our main funding source, which is the taxpayers. The second leg represents our annual sources of revenue. These include the annual appeal, free fees from uh, extended use of materials, room rentals, and also money raised by the Friends of the Library. The third leg is the annual distribution from the Princeton Public Library Foundation Endowment. We are very fortunate to benefit from a healthy endowment that is governed by a board of local volunteer professionals using best legal practices. The endowment allows us to continue to innovate and supplement taxpayer support. All three legs of our funding are really important. Combine this funding with our staff and together it all adds up to a five-star library, a national honor we received for the fifth year in a row in 2020. Before I turn it over to Susan, I wanna say a few things about our staff who are amazing and who have met every challenge thrown at them this past year. This is Becky and Anna, one of our, at one of our most recent outreach events. You might be surprised to learn that we have a dozen full-time staff members who all live in town. So our staff are your neighbors. In recent years, the library has prioritized hiring so that the staff reflects the diversity of the community. As a result, we now have staff who are able to communicate with customers in 17 languages. And now Susan Chernick will give you details of our 2021 budget. In it, you will see reflected a continuation 
of the unprecedented services that the library provided last year. We will continue to serve the needs of our community by investing in high quality print and digital resources, creating innovative programs and initiatives, being a support network for children and families, boosting economic development and workplace skills, helping to bridge the divide, both physical and virtual spaces where everyone in the community is welcome. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Susan. Okay, am I unmuted now? Yes, yes, Susan, okay. we can see you. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Jennifer, and good evening, everyone. I'm going to go into a little bit um, more detail about the library's 2021 proposed budget and the effort we make to minimize the impact on municipal funding. I'll touch on our various revenue sources and expense categories and how we manage the budget. First, we'll look at our revenue sources, some of which can be very volatile, varying from year to year. The most significant source of funding is taxpayer support from the municipality and the state. For 2021, the four and a half million dollar request to the municipality represents 80% of the budget, the library's budget. Annually, we've requested between a one and a half and 2% increase. 2021 represents a 1.75% increase over 2020 funding. 580,000 of revenue comes from unrestricted donations. Included in this is the foundation's regulated distribution from the unrestricted portion of the endowment. Our development staff, which consists of two and a half people, fundraise for the library, the friends, and the foundation, and have a projected goal of 240,000 to be raised towards this year's library's revenue. The success of fundraising is often subject to stock market trends, the ability to host events, and maintain personal contact with our amazing donors. In 2020, that staff did an incredible job to rally support. Restricted donations are budgeted at 158,000. The restricted endowment funds represent specific donor intent of how their contributions will be spent in perpetuity. For example, a large part of the funding comes from the National Endowment for Humanities, which focuses spending on support for programs and materials highlighting their mission. There are also endowments that target very specific collections like the Jean Featherly Byrne Endowment to support books for children. Grants for the Princeton Environmental Film Festival and Children's Book Festival were also part of the donor restricted funds. What we categorize as general funds revenue mostly comes from customer fees and on-site activities such as rentals and equipment usage, sale of items and cafe income, all of which were drastically reduced or non-existent in 2020. 2021 will be a slow climb until full hours and visitors are restored to the library, allowing for those revenue streams to recover. The Friends of the Library have been a reliable and great source of funding for our materials collection, often supporting the library with between 200 and 240,000 annually. However, due to the loss of sales from their on-site bookstore having been closed, fewer events, and having to change their annual Beyond Words fundraiser to a virtual event, which was a monumental effort, they had to reduce their contribution to 75,000 for 2020 and 2021. That's a loss of about $300,000 in revenue over two years. After budgeting expected revenues for 2021, our budget also pulls 95,000 from our reserves to cover a shortage. We're using approximately 13% of our reserves to, ba to balance the budget. Turning to expenses, municipal funds are allocated to the largest cost categories of the library's budget, salaries and benefits, building and equipment and insurance. Salaries and benefits totals $4 million. 70% of this budget is for salaries. We manage the salaries budget closely, analyzing and restructuring staffing levels continually, particularly with open positions. Due to these efforts, the budget has only increased a total of 5.5% since 2016. That includes the cumulative effect of an annual average 1.5% COLA. Considering that cumulative effect, the 2020 salaries budget is actually 2% lower than where it would be after considering just the annual increases due to COLA. That reduction is due to staffing management. 
The other 30% or 1.1 million of this budget is for fixed expenses beyond our control to manage. These include the library state, state mandated pension liability, state health benefit costs, and state and federal payroll taxes. Building equipment totals 577,000. Municipalities funds support 84% of the cost to maintain the building, which is owned by the town. The library funds the other 94,000. The building is aging and we've seen an increase in building maintenance costs, which outpaces the annual one and a half to 2% increases in our funding requests. Two examples of significant increases impacting our 2021 budget our HVAC service and maintenance and electricity, electric utility rates. In 2020, we went out for public bidding for a new HVAC maintenance and services contract. The lowest bidder came in at 40% above our prior contract. That's an additional $8,000 the library will need to cover this year. We also renegotiated our third party electric utility contract that had a fixed rate since 2016 when the last contract was executed. The new rate is 19% higher, which will cost approximately 18,000 more annually. However, the good news is that although the electric rates have been steadily increasing since we negotiated in September, we locked in at a rate that's currently 28 cents per kilowatt hour, lower than the PSEG market rate. This contract is a contracted fixed rate, so we're not, we're not subject to market fluctuations and it translates to a one month savings of $13,000 in February. We expect to save the library between one and $3,000 a month due to the contracted rate. Library materials collections, which is the heart and soul of the library is surprisingly only 8% of our budget. To offset some of the rising costs I've mentioned, we've kept this budget relatively flat at 440,000 for about six years even considering the rising demand for digital materials that are costlier than print materials, as Jennifer explained earlier. General costs are budgeted at 271,000. The largest component of this category is insurance costs that are supported with municipal funds. A significant increase we have seen in insurance is with our workers' compensation premium, which is half of the insurance costs. Calculation of the experience rating charged is, ex is established by the state and after having only three workers comp cases over the past five years, we have seen an 81% increase in our annual premium with escalation from 27,000 in 2017 to 48,000 in 2020. Technology costs are 186,000. The move towards electronic services has prompted the library to invest in technology that improves and simplifies the public's experience. Over the past five years, we've seen a 19% increase in technology costs for additional software and purchases, um, maintenance costs, contracts, upgrades on the systems that support our customers' user experience, fees for more wireless access, licensing costs for hotspots, and even a 40% increase in our shared service agreement with the school in town for a technology support specialist. Administrative costs are the lowest expense in our budget, just 83,000. We've been managing these costs to keep the budget flat for years. For many of our costs, our vendors bill annual increases between five and 10%. We actively negotiate with each vendor and usually succeed at keeping increases closer to 3%, if not lower. So in summary, the library is challenged with meeting the rising cost of operations that far exceeds the annual request of 1.75% without sacrificing the level of service expected by our deserving community. We clearly understand the challenges of the municipality in meeting those same obstacles. We hope that we have shown how hard we work to minimize our ask of municipal support by actively negotiating with our vendors, managing volatile revenue sources, streamlining the variable costs that are within our control and finding ways to compensate for those rising fixed costs that are beyond our control. I believe we work incredibly well with the municipality and I'm always grateful for the support I get from Sandy Webb. I'd like to finish up by just saying that I've been the library's finance director for six and a half years. I'm still amazed at how much our staff accomplishes each year. Their passion for the community, 
and the community's passion for the library. And so much of what the library is able to provide is due to the tremendous support from the municipality. And now back to Jennifer. Thanks, Susan. Um, that's our presentation. And I just wanna thank you again for having us here tonight and giving us the, the, the opportunity to present this to you. And we appreciate the continued municipal support. Council questions, comments? Eve. I'd just like to thank uh, Jennifer and Susan. I know it's been a really difficult year, especially for Jennifer who had no honeymoon period at all before she had to, uh, you know, swivel to, to deal with this pandemic in a situation where she was so incredibly new. So uh, just want to express uh, my appreciation uh, for that. And um, I, you know, truly believe that the library is a really careful uh, steward of municipal tax money and municipal resources. And I'd like to stress um, in my experience, and I've had a lot of experience being there, how much this is an institution that serves the needs of the entire town. This is not, uh, it, this is a place where, you know, as we say, the community living room where kids come after school, not right now, but they will again, hopefully, uh, to hang out on the third floor where there's a dedicated staff to look after them, who they know, um, not just the children's librarians, but a lot of the uh, 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 service staff, the maintenance staff who have relationships with a lot of the kids and really uh, mentor them and, and support them. So it's, I really uh, appreciate what the library does and uh, Susan, Jennifer and the entire library staff, I think a number of whom are here tonight. Uh, thank you for your hard work this year and, and thank you for coming before us and I hope we'll see you on an annual basis. Thank you, we look forward to it, Eve, thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, um, I just had a question. Um, I know that there were some recent upgrades or replacements of, of significant portions of the mechanical system in the library. And I was wondering if you know whether you were able to utilize, you know, the state has clean energy programs, which help make energy, up, uh, energy efficient upgrades to systems like electrical systems and HVAC systems. Do you know if the library was able to take advantage of that in the new HVAC system? We did. We applied for and received a New Jersey Clean Energy grant for 23,000. That was the maximum available. And um, we did receive that. So we had a capital project of $600,000 from the municipality. The actual cost came in at about 615,000, I think. So we actually returned the amount of the leftover grant funds to the municipality. So we returned about $5,300 from the grant back to the municipality. Great, thank you. Any, Leticia and then Michelle. Who was next? Was I next? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you for that presentation. Uh, but also I wanna take this opportunity for, to thank you for being a really great community partner especially you know, with human services. I know you collaborated, collaborated uh, over the years. Uh, almost anything that takes place in the community, especially through human services, is in collaboration with the library. And, and thank you to Kim Dorman too, who's also very involved. Uh, but also I want to especially thank you for uh, hosting uh, the community ID. Uh, so the community ID is something that be, that the li library made it possible for us to bring back uh, to Princeton. Uh, initially, it was only being offered in Trenton for a while, and uh, and the community ID for many in our community who that is the only form of ID, the only form for them to be actually feel that they belong here, uh, that has a Princeton address is is really very meaningful. That you know things that we take for granted that I think these are just one of the services that the library provides that um, that I, I we truly appreciate and I want to take the opportunity to thank you for that. 
Thank you. It's a really important program for us. It was the first in-person program restored. So we were, we were happy to do it. Thank you for that. Michelle? Yeah, and thank you. I, I really appreciate um, your, your willingness and openness to you know, talk with us and figure out you know, ways that we can belt tighten in these difficult times. Um, you know, the Finance Committee, uh, myself and uh, Councilwoman uh, Cohen and Councilwoman Sachs have met also with Jennifer and Susan. And, um, you know, we need to keep, you know, working on cost savings and looking at, you know, ways that we can, um, you know, maybe there can be more, you know, fundraising. I know that friends do a great job. You have the endowment and the endowment is um, quite large. And, you know, it it's makes it um, great to have that as a, I, I look at that as kind of the surplus of the municipality. Uh, there's an endowment that the library has to fall back on and be able to um, annually uh, take from that. But we, um, you know, we need to continue to work together to figure out ways to, um, to work with all of our community partners. Um, when we look at the, um, you know, the, the library, it's, it is a great treasure for the town. Um, but we just need to make sure that the you know taxpayers um, understand that this is a commitment that we're making and on their behalf um, to help uh, create funding. I mean, there's um, state mandated funding, which is part of what we're funding, and then there's additional funding. Um, and we want to be able to continue to support the library as much as possible. And we appreciate anything you can do as well on your end with grants, friends of the library, the endowment, and other sources of, of revenue. So we'll just continue to have this conversation and mm -hmm. it's an annual um, uh, commitment to come before council. And, um, and as we introduce the budget tonight, we'll talk a little bit about kind of the tight, the tight um, situation that we're in as a municipality, as a town, as a state, as a country. And, um, and so you know, we all have to do our part. So really appreciate uh, you coming. Tonight. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for inviting us and thanks for continuing the conversation. We look forward to working with the Finance Committee as well. Thank you very much. Wait. Yeah, I know this is about the budget presentation, but I would be remiss if I didn't say um, uh, I just uh, I have so many great things to say about the Princeton Public Library. I was going to say, don't tell the other institutions in town this, but you're certainly one of my favorite. I don't want the rest <laughs> of them to get jealous. And uh, so thank you for just being a great uh, hub of services. Uh, for the town, um, the work you you did with uh, PrincetonCovid.org for the the website, I think was 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 invaluable and fantastic, and uh, just the, the the many things you do that keeps the town together, such as the uh, you know some of these things are, are somewhat of a hiatus because of COVID, but like the not in our town presentations that were uh, being made there, but there's just so many things you do for the town that that um, we, we can't calculate in in uh, in, in dollars and cents. And um, for the as, as far as the municipal budget goes, um, you know I think it's just just the best money well spent is the money that uh, the municipality uh, gives to the library. And thanks for being such a great uh, steward of of those funds. Thank you, thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate your support, and I won't tell anyone else what you said about us being your favorite. Only the, no one heard that. Okay. Any other comments? If not, we. Do have a long agenda we should move on thank you okay jennifer susan thank you very much appreciate thank you. Thank you have a good night thanks night. take care night. okay we have a number of uh budget items coming up um so before we do the budget items there were two emails that came in michelle has one and david has one michelle do you have yours handy and maybe you read yours and then david can read his I do. I actually, there's two in the email. I'll start and then uh, we can decide. If, uh, okay, sorry. There might have been two in there. My bad. Uh, I, Mark, I if I can just clarify, we're, we're into the section of the meeting uh, for comments for items that are not on the agenda. Is that correct? No, the budget okay, items. Sure. Are the next. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to read the comments that came in according to that, if David has another email. And then we can give our reports and 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 move on. So, all right, let me um, start with this. So, just give me one second. <clears throat> Got it. Okay. So, my name is Shuk Ying Chan, and I am a resident of Princeton. 
I write to urge you to reconsider the budget cuts to essential services. Princeton is a town that has vast inequalities between some of the wealthiest people in the country and some of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged populations. At a time of unprecedented crisis, essential services are more needed than ever. From my work with Princeton Mutual Aid, I have seen how hard it is for neighbors who are down on their luck to get back on their feet with exploitative landlords, unaffordable rent, and costs of living, and very few resources for those struggling with mental health. I urge you to consider instead to divest funds from the policing budget and strengthen the social services available, which is ultimately the most effective way to ensure the health and well being of our community as a whole. I also urge you to consider the proposal that a coalition, including PMA or Princeton Mutual Aid, is putting forth to build a community center in town, which would help neighbors navigate available resources much more easily instead of having individuals fall through the cracks because accessing these services is no trivial task, especially for those who are already struggling with many burdens. Together, we can make this town a more just and equitable place for all, and I urge you to seriously consider this proposal as one important step towards that. Thank you. Okay, the next, I have one more here. And this is from Alex Mamina. He wrote, hello. Please see below for comments on tonight's council meeting. Sorry. As a resident, as a Princeton resident and member of Princeton Mutual Aid, I am concerned about the proposed budget and the disproportionate funding of our police department as compared to underfunded services in town. In 2020, the Princeton municipality approved more than $10,306,061 on appropriate ex expenditures for its police department, which is 60.3 times more than what the municipal, municipality spent on human services, 10 times more than what the municipality, municipality spent on parks and recreation, and six and a half times more than what the municipality spent on its fire department that same year. Despite a major projected budget shortfall, the council plans to move forward with hiring five positions for the town's police department. If the projected shortfall means our town has to make tough decisions about funding, cutting the spending of a police force that consumes the largest share of our budget should be the first step. I also have concerns about the spending of last year's police department budget. Last year, the police department did not spend $200,000 of their budgeted expenses. Is that because less overtime was needed in the past year? Should the police department examine if the amount of overtime in general can be cut back? How much of that overtime can be attributed to the practice of hiring out police officers to non-police security duties? Best, Alex Mamina. Thank you. I, I have some comments back, but can address. Them. Okay, well, let's let's let David read the uh, the other one, and, and just so everyone watching the meeting understands, there's a cutoff at six thirty p.m. the evening of the meeting for people to send in comments by email. And so what we try to do is have uh, different council members, different members elected uh, of the governing body read those emails. So we're just sharing what uh, members of the public have, have sent to us. David, you had the next one? Yep. Hi, Princeton Council. My name is Rishi Samaryaji. I am a Princeton University graduate student and member of Princeton Mutual Aid a local mutual aid organization that has been doing a great deal of advocacy with vulnerable members of the Princeton and Princeton area communities. I'm simply emailing two points. One, the budget introduction is a crucial time to assert that Princeton prior, prioritizes helping its most economically vulnerable, especially as the economic effects of the pandemic continue to rage on. This entails adequately more than it is currently Funding the Human Services Department, which deals firsthand with the most destitute of Princeton community members. The same folks PMA has been helping for the duration of the pandemic. It is important that if what it takes is for funding to be re reallocated from the Public Safety Department to the Human Services Department, that these are the steps Princeton Council takes. Two. It is important that there is community overview over the budget process. While I understand there were concerns over the representativeness and openness of the proposed advisory citizen committee, it is important that this function exist 
to increase the democratic nature of the budget process. A very small minority of the town shows up to public meetings. This opens the door to anti-democratic measures and measures unfriendly to public welfare. I strongly urge the council to resuscitate the advisory citizen committee over the budget process. Best, Rishi Samayaji. Thank you, David. Okay, those were the emails that came in. Uh, why don't we start with uh, ordinance 202107, which is number one under the <laughs> under section uh, eight of budget, uh, an ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriation limits and to establish a cap bank. The public hearing would be on April 12th, 2021. And this would be a roll call vote. David? Yeah, I'll move to introduce. Thank you. Is there a second? Michelle? Okay. Uh, Sandy or Mark, is there any summary that you need to provide before the uh, council votes on this? The only thing I would say is just to remind people that again, um, this is not raising expenditures at all. It is just a, um, what we do in order to just bank this, um, the um, a difference in our cap um, to put it in the bank. It's not an, a authorization to actually spend. So a lot of people get confused with that. Okay, thank There's you. There's something slightly off topic. I, I know we're talking about this ordinance, but are we gonna have a chance to comment on the emails which came in? Yes. Uh, yeah, sure. Because I know Michelle said she had a comment and I have a comment also. Okay, do you, okay, we could stop this at the moment. And if you do you want to comment before we do this, the vote on this, is that what you're saying? Well, the comments would be on, on uh, regarding the responses to the uh, emails which were read. So okay. I know Michelle said she had a comment earlier and I have a comment also. Okay. I do, I, I just thought we could, when we get to the intro, because it, it ties into the budget presentation, I was just gonna maybe answer them at the same time, but whatever's, whatever's best, we can do it. Well, now. okay, I, I kind of agree with that. I, why don't we just finish this and then, Dwayne, why don't we do the comments, but the next item is the actual, in, the resolution to introduce the budget. Okay. I mean, okay. okay. I, I mean, do you want me to make my comment now? I'm a little confused. What are you, what are you saying? Let, let, me, let me do the vote on this. Okay. And the next the next resolution is to introduce the budget. So I thought that would be the time to, to make the comments. Okay. Okay. So this is a, a roll call vote. Uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, could you read the roll? Ms. Pearl Lambros? Yes. Ms. Niedergang? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. Mr. Williamson? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so the next item, 21-97, a resolution to introduce the 2021 municipal budget. Michelle, do you have comments? And then, Michelle, when you're done, Dwayne, you might have comments. Um, I, I do. It's uh, Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, I do. Uh, first of all, I was going to, I have a little brief report from the Finance Committee, um, and then I could roll right in or maybe i'll go ahead and let's answer the questions um comments to the letters first then i'll make my report and then we can do the introduction if that works okay. so um i just wanted to comment um i'm losing track here so in terms of the new hires for the police i just want to clarify that that is we're keeping to the same level of police force it's 53 or 54 i think is our parity but what happens is we need to, is it 54 53 53 thank you and, and we've we've stayed at that level for many years now the 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 um the difference is we have to hire to the retirements so anticipating and retirements that are going to happen within this next 18 month cycle um in order to recruit you have to recruit and then you in, in order to recruit uh, diversity in the uh, police force and really make it open, we'd like to recruit pe um, people that have not necessarily gone through the training process. So once they're recruited and hired, then they have to go to the school and the training, and it takes a long time. It takes you know a year or so, and and we could ask um, maybe. Um, 
um, um, Captain Bukhari to, to talk more to this, but that's my understanding that when we are hiring them, it's not five additional. So we are not increasing. So that's our parity, so just you know, that short answer. Um, yeah, and just Michelle on that, if we were to actually hire for all the anticipated retirements in the next 18 months, we'd be hiring six people. But right now we're only looking to at some point later in the year, Higher up to four, so we've reduced the amount that was the amount was, that was requested was six positions, and we've said that we were only going to look at a maximum of four. Anyway, sorry Thank to you. you know, and I think that the other uh, issues that were raised, I think we're going to cover them when we go through the budget. So I'm going to I'm, I'm going to I will turn that over to Councilman Williams. Thank you. Yeah. Dwayne. Thanks. Thanks. Just just a general comment I'd like to make uh, about some of the. Um, public comments that are coming in about comparing, you know, budgets, let's say for human services versus budget for the police, et cetera. I think um, I, think I just as many, you know, as mayor, and I, and I think I could speak for much of council about saying this, that we do really care about the most vulnerable in town, but I, I, I have a problem with the, the misleading statements, such as we budget this much for the police, but only this for human services and the multiples, et cetera. Um, let me tell you why it's so extremely misleading. First of all, you look at the amounts of money that's raised in town. Of course, there's only a certain percentage that we as the municipality uh, manage, you know, whatever the 60 something million bucks, which is probably 21 or so percent of monies raised. Uh, we send about 30% of monies raised to the county. Of that money that goes to the county, a, a huge amount of that goes to Mercer County Board of Social Services. So a lot of uh, Board of Social Services issues are taken care of, uh, are used, that monies are used to take care of a lot of the most vulnerable in different ways. And we're not even talking about, let's say, federal money from HUD or whatever with Princeton Housing Authority, et cetera. So for the parts that, that we're responsible for, for that, 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 that really minority of monies raised, which is that 60 something million dollars that goes to the municipal budget, you know, we're responsible for paying for the police. Much of the issue, much of the taking care of the most vulnerable a lot of that comes from the county level, et cetera. So when people make these comparisons, they're really false comparisons. And I, I would like to think that I, as much as everyone here is a champion for, or we attempt to be champions for the most vulnerable. But I just wanted to put that out there because this came up quite a, a bit um, in the past and we're st starting to hear the same things again. And we especially have been hearing it over the last couple of years uh, when it comes to comparing uh, but monies used to uh, fund the police versus monies used to fund human services, et cetera. So I just wanted to, to make that point. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, Mia. Um, I have a comment and, que and a question. Um, building on uh, Dwayne's um, uh, explanation of the money that goes to the um, county social services, I, um, I think one of the issues is that Princeton is not getting um, enough back in from the county in terms of our needs. And this was something that was um, our, our human services needs. And this was one of the things that was uh, raised at the recent um, county commissioner debate. And, and I think one of the suggestions that uh, one of the candidates made was to have a county satellite office of um, their social service agency in Princeton. And I hope that um, that's something that we can continue to explore because um, we do have uh, needs, human service needs in Princeton that are more akin to an urban area than some of our other neighboring municipalities um, like homelessness and um, other needs that uh, we are really not um, uh, getting what we need from the county. And so that's certainly a conversation that we intend as council members to uh, continue to explore with the county. But my uh, the other thing is one letter writer said that he was opposing the cuts to core services that we are making, I, I'm just, I'm not aware of any cuts to, are we making any cuts to core services? Okay, so, um, and then the other thing about the police budget um, is just in terms of how the, uh, for those of us who are newer on council, is there, I mean, how much room leeway is there? Um, my sense of the police budget is that, you know, 
this is a lot of it is statutory. And then there's, um, you know, um, the negotiation with, I guess it's the, the police union or, or, I mean, but I don't, I even had the sense that there's um, much flexibility in terms of that. I, I did, I thought someone said that this year, um, several police positions were being, um, you know, I don't know if eliminated or downsized or whatever, but I don't know if Bob or Mark can elaborate on that. I can one comment, I, okay. go ahead, Bob. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, I was going to make one comment just in general, in general about the police department. Um, and it is um, the cost in the police department is driven by um, the number of employees in the department. And that's required in order to run a 24, um, 365 day operations. It's very um, heavily intensive on employees. Um, so a lot of the cost in the police department is driven on the number of people that it requires to actually run an operations of that size, for that n number of days in a year. Um, so that's a majority of those costs um, when you look at the, the police department costs. And if you had something else, Bob. Oh uh, yeah, just I'll, let me add uh, one thing to what Mark said, and that is that we did do a little shuffling in police um, salaries. We, uh, we are looking at hiring the four people as the mayor had indicated, as opposed to the six and deferring the other two until sometime probably early next year. Uh, that coupled with a request from the uh, chief to uh, look at uh, combining some positions in their records department, that's not police officers, but it's the support staff uh, in which uh, we would be able to trim down a position. So we're evaluating that right now. Um, the last thing I'd like to uh, comment on real quickly that uh, Mia brought up was the discussion we had at the finance committee meeting uh, dealing with social services. I actually have a call into the county and a, uh, a virtual meeting tomorrow uh, at four o'clock. No, I'm sorry, Wednesday at four o'clock. Um, to uh, begin that those discussions with them on a more formal basis to see what we can do to get a satellite office here and what we can expect um, out of that satellite office. Um, I know that that had been discussed many years ago. Um, it never really got off the ground, but I think it's something that the county would, uh, you know, w work with us on and uh, hopefully we can get something started that would expand our local services uh, and but let the county pay for it. Let's go, Eve, Dwayne, and then Leticia. Hi, right, thanks, uh, uh, Mark and or Bob. I'm going to need a little help here. Uh, this is uh, something it took me a while to grapple with. I think uh, people here, the number uh, 53 police officers, and I just want to qualify that again, as uh, Mark was indicating, it's a 24 seven service. So uh, we don't have 53 police officers on the job at, at the same time. I think there's uh, several teams of, is it eight? So it any, uh, maybe someone who's a little more familiar with the details can uh, talk a little bit about that. But I thought it was like several, like four teams of eight that work. But Mark, do you wanna take it from there to just? I believe it's, it's four teams. I'm not sure the exact number of officers. Um, so control the vision. There are four separate teams that run a schedule allow you to do the 365 days a year, plus you have, you know, special units that do traffic. You have units um, for our state neighborhood unit, um, and then you have just the administrative staff. Um, so when you look at that number, it does seem like a large number. Once you start putting that all together, you can see why it escalates to a number of 50. Uh, Dwayne, and then Leticia. I just wanted to make a quick follow-up to, uh, to Amir's comments. I, I didn't want my comments to be misconstrued that I think there, there aren't things that the county can't do better. The point I was making is that I, I, it's, it's just misleading to just talk about what's happening within the intra uh, Princeton budget as if that's all that's been done for, uh, for, the, for the, the most vulnerable in our town. And wanted to mention that there's the, the whole other pool of money that's over at the county. And of course, I, I personally support uh, having a local satellite office uh, from the county here, et cetera. So just wanted to, 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 to make sure that's clear. Uh, to the public. Thank you, Dwayne. Leticia. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, what I wanted to add was that while uh, I understand that we rely on the county to provide the funding for the ser social services that we provide, uh, I feel that most definitely there is more need in our community. And most definitely we should be advocating either at the county, 
the state level or both for more funding that is needed. Because one thing that I do not want to see, some of you may recall that pre-consolidation uh, when there was the human services was a joint human, the joint department of human services for the borough and the township. There was actually at one time the suggestion of not funding it, of sending our residents to whether Trenton or somewhere else when, uh, when in need of these uh, services. So that's something, you know, I like the idea of having a satellite office that can provide some of those services here, but you know, if anything, we should be advocating for more funding so we can provide those services locally. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Any other comments? If not, we'll, we have a resolution to introduce the, uh, the budget. Does someone want to move that? Michelle makes the motion. Eve seconds. Uh, any questions on the motion? Well, Michelle? I wanted to make a small report on it and then I guess sure. the, the, um, and then let the staff and, and others, you know, talk about it. But if I, if I can just, um, <clears throat> so let me, uh, let me just get that up just a sec. Um, okay. So we're working on finding ways to cut costs, obviously, to address the gap in our revenue this year. Um, so assuming that we track at the same level as last year with non-tax revenue, we've got parking meter, parking garage revenue that's significantly lower this year. Um, municipal court revenue, hotel taxes are down, and other licensing and permitting fees. And uh, our CFO, um, San Sandra Webb, our administrator, or our administrators right now, um, our staff, and, and, and our finance committee, we're really working, but the staff has really worked hard at finding cost savings, going back to the department heads, but our budget shortfall, even utilizing, and they'll go over it with you, even utilizing the surplus, we still have a, a shortfall of $2.1 million. Now, we believe, we all believe that this is an exception, an exceptional year because of the decrease in non-tax revenue, that it's primarily all COVID-related. So we're all optimistic that this will bounce back once businesses fully reopen and parking you know, resumes. Some aspects of permitting, licensing fees that have been delayed, um, will also be back as well as inspections and municipal court fees. So this is just 2021 as it was in 2020, and we should be back to normal levels after the pandemic, God willing, is behind us. One thing that this budget shortfall highlights for us, though, and something we really need to think of going forward, is that our discretionary spending and our municipal budget is very limited. It's roughly about $15 million per year. So it made our budget, our budget is particularly vulnerable to decreases in non-tax revenue. So one of the outcomes of this is that we are looking for our community partners and really everybody in every department to find cost savings in an effort to keep Princeton affordable for middle income families and ease the continuous upward pressure on property taxes. We are really looking at ways we can save on an ongoing basis as well. So in summary, I just want to say we, we, we are um, really hoping um, and really grateful that there is an American Rescue Plan because um, that will be the only way we can cover this $2.1 million deficit without raising taxes this year. Um, our allocation for 2021, our maximum allocation is $3 million. However, we won't be able to count on this until we have more clarity on the requirements of what will be covered and how it will be covered. We're optimistic that we will qualify for at least part, if not all of the 3 million, but in order to be conservative in our estimates, you'll see tonight's introduction reflects a tax increase, but our hope and our commitment is to keep our goal of a zero tax increase this year. Thank you. I'll turn it over now to staff to explain the budget. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Sandy, or who's gonna? <clears throat> I think I was nominated to, uh, to, to just give a brief, a brief update on the budget. I mean, I know we did our presentation just last week, Mark and I, so I'm gonna keep this really brief. Uh, the budget that you have before you for introduction tonight is $66.6 .6 million. 
That's up uh, about 2.3 million from last year. As Michelle mentioned, there's currently a 2.9 cent tax increase. Um, but we wanna be clear that this is the start of the public process of the budget. Um, this is just the beginning for us. Um, you know, one of the things that I know Michelle touched on also was that who would have thought a year ago, um, the huge impact that the pandemic would have on our budgets. Revenues were down significantly. I won't go over all of them again that Michelle already touched on, but I will say that um, council did take um, some action last year when at the end of the year, when we canceled um, some significant budget appropriations, both in the current fund and in the parking. And uh, those, those cancellations helped to mitigate uh, all the revenue shortfalls that we had. And so it had minimal impact on our fund balance because of the actions that we took. So tonight, um, you have a couple of resolutions on, you'll have the introduction of the budget, the public hearing um, and introduction of amendments to hopefully get us back down to a zero cent tax increase will be on April 26th. At that time, we will plan to amend the budget and depending on the amount of those amendments, um, there are some statutes that if we exceed certain percentages, then we will have to have a public hearing on the amendment and that will postpone the adoption of the budget to hopefully the first meeting in May. But that's our goal is to work with the finance committee um, and to look for further cuts on this budget so that we can uh, keep the tax rate at a 0% increase. Thank you, Sandy. Eve? Thank you, uh, Sandy. That was uh, a very good uh, brief explanation. Can you just remind me what what is the deadline? What are the deadlines imposed by the state on this process? So we're pushing back to May and what is kind of if there is a drop dead date or a date in which everything has to be done and submitted? Sure. So the introduction, which is normally in February, was extended until the end of March. So for introduction, we're going to be right on target. The adoption is um, by the end of April or at your next regularly scheduled meeting. So again, we'll be in compliance with that. You know, we had talked um, with finance committee at, at one of our recent meetings in light of the federal stimulus money coming, whether there would be further extensions on the budget calendar. We're hearing from the state that there will not be. So this will set the wheels in motion to keep us, you know, in conformity with the state statutes. Thank you. Other questions by the council? Uh, Bob. Not a member of the council, but I just want to make one more comment to what Sandy said, and that is to recognize the uh, job that previous governing bodies, uh, the finance committees in past years and the staff did, in which to get the community in a position where you're really only looking at a 2.9 cent tax increase at this juncture. Had the, not the proper planning and the development of surplus and um, some of the other fiscal decisions that were made um, over the past several years uh, not put into place, the, uh, the pandemic year would have been much more devastating on the community. So I just I think that that should be recognized because there have been a lot of sound fiscal policies that the community has initiated and they this year is a direct result of it. So we're going to be in a position um, where all we need is, you know, $2.1 million and not $9 million. So um, it's, it's not a great place to be, but it's a lot better place to be. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. There's no further council questions. Is there a motion to introduce the budget? I think Michelle. I think we, yeah. I already did. Didn't we already. Oh, did already we? I'm sorry. And then we went, yeah. went to comments. I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah. You just okay. need to vote. Yep. Okay. Uh, this is just a voice vote. All in. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Raise your hand so we can. Aye. 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 Okay, that's everyone. Thank you. All right, next is uh, 2198 resolution approving local budget examination for the 2021 budget. Mark or Bob, what does that mean? Or Sandy, one of you. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, so every third year, our budget is reviewed by the state. Um, this is one of the years that we are not under review. So I have to certify that our budget is in accordance with all the state statutes. And that's what this resolution 
allows. Thank you, Sandy. Any questions for Sandy? If not, someone, Eve, is that a question or a motion? A motion. motion. Thank Can't you. you tell the difference? Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Eve made the motion. Is there a second? Michelle got her hand up. All in favor, uh, please aye. say aye. 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 Okay, that's everyone. Thank you. 2199, resolution of the Mayor and Council of Princeton authorizing compliance with the United States Equal Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's enforcement guidance on the consideration of arrest and conviction records in employment decisions under Title VII of the Civil Rights, Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, Leticia. I, I did have a question for Mr. DeShield, but I also wanted to move it forward. Uh, but first my question uh, that I know, I believe it was last year, perhaps the year before, that the Civil Rights Commission was advocating for the uh, Ban the Box initiative. And I actually did read, uh, you know, in the past, I'm not sure if this has come up before, but thank you for whoever provided the link to, uh, to what we were signing on to because uh, I actually did read it. But I also was wondering whether the civil, what the Civil Rights Commission was advocating for is something that is still going to be considered. We, have, we, have, we were already doing it prior to the civil rights consideration. Um, we've also sat down with them with other initiatives um, concerning um, this issue. Yeah. And we were already doing those. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to confirm that. But no, I want, no, I wish to move it forward. Okay, so Leticia is making the motion. Dwayne, I'll are second. you? Dwayne seconds. Yes. Any other questions? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that's everyone. Thank you very much. All right, next on the agenda, public comments for items that are not on the agenda. Um, did you wish for me to read the letter that came in? Yeah, Leticia, if you could do the letter that you have, and then Dwayne also is going to have uh, sure. two to read Thank after you read yours. Thank you. And this letter was actually signed by, at last count, more than 170 uh, residents. So I'm not going to read their names. Uh, but I, I do want to first, before I read it, to clarify that even though some of the uh, residents who signed on to this letter are members of the Human Services Commission, that this is not uh, a Human Services Commission initiative. I just wanted to clarify that before I read it. So it starts with, uh, dear mayor and council members, we are an interfaith coalition of Princeton residents who have long been involved in supporting vulnerable neighbors and frustrated by the patchwork of services that do not sufficiently address the real needs in our community. Despite being a world famous town of plenty, we have neighbors who occupy the margins of society. In many cases, these neighbors don't know where to go and are often recycled through a futile circuit of siloed agencies that fail to provide effective interventions. Too often, we send, we send these vulnerable neighbors elsewhere to places like Trenton that are saturated with many of the issues that Princeton and similar communities export their way. We, the undersigned, know that it doesn't have to be this way. We can and must do more for these vulnerable Princetonians whose ages span from infant to senior. To that end, we advocate for the creation of an innovative Princeton Community Center or PCC that combines services that will effectively address the needs of these Princetonians in a respectful, holistic and coordinated manner. This hub would welcome the Home for Human Services and Health Departments and Corner House with a dedicated staff, social workers, and community educators, open during convenient hours, including evenings and weekends, and would be a welcoming multi multicultural place for all Princeton residents. 
For those who need it, the PCC would adopt a case management protocol and provide a centralized place for services or a warm handover to the appropriate agency after facilitating an appointment or connection to a specific staff member. As a hub, providing an ample menu of services in partnership with specialized agencies and local faith-based resources, the PCC would showcase the breadth of creativity for which Princeton is renowned. Initiatives and services could include K through 12 tutoring, classes in computer and financial literacy, business, art, cooking, and nutrition, GED, and ESL, employment advocacy and training, emergency housing support services, community garden and environmental education space, meeting place for support groups, screening and intake for services. Fortunately, the municipality already owns the ideal property for such a community center. We urge members of the council to reserve block 7301, lots one, two, and three, located at 237 Harrison, and, and also 814 Clearview Avenue, the site of the old Princeton Fire and Rescue Squad, and the adjoining two homes for this purpose. This strategic location makes sense in the context of Princeton's master plan. Walkability and proximity to bike lanes and public transportation and laundry facilities and grocery shopping at the Princeton Shopping Center. It would also require very little repurposing of existing structures, allowing the center to start operating within a short period, period of time until a more permanent and larger location is built. While the sale of these properties was brief, briefly brought up during the introduction of the 2021 municipal budget, we believe such action is not necessary and the misguided waste of a strategically located property. It's worth remembering that the pandemic, which has exposed and exacerbated inequities in our community is not over. Indeed, we believe things may get worse before they get better. With this in mind, we need to understand that returning to business as usual will monumentally fail the most uh, vulnerable among us and eventually weaken our so social fabric. And we can and we must do better. This council has the opportunity to commit to make history and raise the quality of life for all Princetonians by supporting the vision of this community center first, by reserving the block 7301 properties and subsequently by working together with this coalition to make this community center a reality. Please make sure to, well then this asking folks to sign the letter in support of it. And again, it has over 170 names, which I, I wasn't going to read out loud. Okay. Well, that, those will be added to the minutes, of course, so we'll have all the names in there. Yes. Uh, Joanne, I think you had two um, two other letters you agreed to read for us uh, that had come in before the six thirty-five. Sure. Yeah, these uh, both comments are regarding Hilltop, and uh, since I'm the liaison to Rick, I, I, we I guess we collectively considered it um, appropriate for me to read them. Um, the first is from, and I apologize for mispronouncing the last name, Deborah Hunsinger from one sixty-five Ross Stevenson Circle, and she wrote. Uh, Dear council members, I was distressed to learn from letters and town topics two weeks ago that plans are being made to dig up the beautiful green grass at Hilltop Park and replace it with some kind of synthetic plastic turf to make way for a soccer youth club to use the field for their own purposes. I have three serious objections to this plan. One, the people in the neighborhood most immediately affected by the, the decision were not consulted. I understand that there were several publicly announced commissions and council meetings in which the decisions uh, were discussed, but that it is something quite different from holding a widely publicized public hearing on the subject. Campbell Woods is a moderate income neighborhood and Princeton Community Village is one of the few places in town in which there's affordable low income housing. The vast majority, vast majority of the children in this neighborhood could not afford to join one of these soccer clubs. They would effectively have their backyard taken away from them 
and given to the children of families that could afford the high fees. Two, the green grass of the soccer field is the only thing that makes Hilltop Park a park. The rest of it is a concrete skateboard park, a basketball court, a playground for small children, and a softball playing field along with a parking lot. Where would anyone be able to fly a kite, throw a frisbee, relax, and enjoy a picnic on a sunny afternoon if the only open green space were taken away? Three, the impact on the environment would be detrimental and long-lasting. Does Princeton really want to let this kind of plastic uh, to take over such large swath of its municipal parks? I don't mind paying property taxes to have excellent schools for our children to pay our police and public work and well, to pay our police and public works departments. It is bad enough that my federal income taxes pay for wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but I don't want one penny of my property taxes going toward putting artificial turf in the only park that is in walking distance of my home. I have three concrete requests of the council. One, to pass an ordinance that would ban all plastic grass slash synthetic turf on all municipal properties. The taxpayers of this town do not want to fund for-profit sports clubs at our expense and to our detriment. Two, uh, to hold a widely publicized public hearing about Hilltop Park where free and open discussion of the very serious impact this decision has on the neighborhood. Three, to inquire into the possibility of redirecting the monies from the county towards the improvement of our municipal parks. I, to, to, uh, toward the improvement of our municipal parks. I believe that the council did not fully understand the impact these decisions would have on our neighborhood. I urge you to revisit them, reconsider them, and reverse them. The second comment is from Barbara Ajami, and I, I also apologize for that for mispronouncing the last name spelled A-J-A-M-I, from 36 Tupelo Row, uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, she has her phone number here, but I don't think we need to read that into the record. Uh, wrote to the Princeton Township Council. We have been informed that Hilltop Park is about to be changed drastically by the installation of a for-profit soccer field. We residents of Princeton Community Village, one of the densely populated neighborhoods near the park, wish to register our opposition. First, let us state that the park already has many facilities, which all of Princeton enjoys, a playground for young children, a basketball court, and skate park for older kids, an existing soccer field that is much more uh, eco-friendly than the one proposed in a softball field. Hilltop Park is beloved as well for its open field, which is used by a great many people around the clock and around the year. It is a wonderful place to enjoy nature, to take a walk, to visit with neighbors, to find space. We citizens of the community do not need, need a land grab uh, by a for-profit high-tech facility that will cost Princeton taxpayers millions in upfront costs and maintenance. Hilltop Park is as lovely as it is, but it is almost overused now. The present soccer field already attracts so many cars that pedestrians are endangered by illegal parking along narrow roads. Residents of Princeton Community Village routinely find their parking spaces commandeered by soccer spectators. The new field will greatly exacerbate PCV's parking problems. Residents of Princeton Community Village, soon to comprise 250 plus households, love the park. Everyone from babies and strollers to seniors use it a lot, and a lot is in, in large case letters. A great concern about the location of Hilltop Park is excessive runoff. The hill slope along Bun Drive below the park is barely stable enough for the constru construction of the past decades. How can it tolerate runoff from additional tons of plastic grass and the toxic base under it? All in all, what can the Princeton Recreation Department and the Recreation Commission be thinking? How can the expanded soccer facility not degrade the environment and the community? We respectfully request that the council hold a special hearing regarding this project and examine the cost of new soccer field in Hilltop Park is not too late to quash a very bad thing. Um, just, just a comment on uh, methodology as far as uh, getting these comments. Um, I, I know I received a lot of letters also in support of the park. Um, those letters didn't specifically say they're for the council meeting. So you know, I just wanted to put that out there that there are other information coming in, but I guess they didn't specifically say they wanted to be read here as part of uh, council comments. Uh, for items not on the agenda. So in the future, if, if folks want to submit um, um, uh, other letters, just, just be aware that you need to say that is, you know, for um, public comment. Wayne, I just, I think we need to make clear that the previous letter um, was signed by 123 members of the Princeton Community Village, just so no one feels that um, left out that the letter- Okay, it didn't say that on what was emailed to me. So uh, I understand th th there was something that was 
Oh, oh, wait a minute. Are, are you talking about the the, the letter from Ms. Lajami was a petition from the 120. Oh, oh, I, I, okay. I know what you're talking about. Okay, yeah. I just didn't say that on what was emailed to me to read here, okay. but I am aware that that exists. That okay. I'm realizing it's it's all the same thing. Okay, I got you. But thanks, Mia, for pointing that out. Sure, sure. Okay, okay. Uh, those were the written comments. Do we have people in the uh, in the audience today that um, want to make public comment? If you raise your hand, um, if you if you raise your hand, the yes, hi. Oh, okay, one, one, one sec. Just one sec. So what we're going to ask you to do is everybody comes in is just say your full name and address, and then um, everybody has three minutes. Okay. But please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Julian Chen. I live at thirty five Macomb Road. I want to speak to the council members about the installation of synthetic turf at Hilltop Park. How we spend the town's money is a reflection of Princeton residents' value. And some of those are fairness, concern for the environment, and being responsible. And to spend money on the synthetic turf project does nothing to reflect those ideals. Placing the synthetic turf at Hilltop Park is not fair to the residents of Hilltop neighborhood. Access to a natural green open space is a basic public amenity that all Princeton residents should have. Therefore, no green space in any existing parks should be ever be converted into a noxious plastic space. Spending money on the synthetic turf field is not environmental. Spending money on this synthetic turf is not being fiscally responsible. The outpouring of opposition from the residents should be taken by the council as a mandate to re-examine re the ill-considered plan from the Recreation Commission. I ask the council to seriously consider holding a special hearing to determine if synthetic turf is something that is appropriate for Princeton. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. So thank you, council members and mayor for allowing the community and me to speak. Uh, so my name is Paul Reese and I live at 25 Campbell Woods Way. I'm also a board member of the HOA here at Campbell Woods. Uh, so I want to thank my fellow uh, community members from the Princeton Community Village in Copperwood for sharing their concerns for this project. I also want to share, I will also want to thank our Dodds Lane friends and Ross Stevenson friends and others who are, are here to support us tonight in expressing the community's overwhelming concerns for this project. Uh, I have many concerns about this project and that installing artificial turf in a small community park like this would be a first and, and I agree uh, with my fellow community members. And now it sounds like the, uh, like the council is moving um, in this direction that we asked the council to take a step back uh, to take a more fo uh, focused holistic look at this project. Um, the first time the plans were shared with uh, the Kimball Woods uh, HOA board, uh, it would, this was mentioned earlier in the evening, it was last week during the walkthrough with the rec department. Um, they're, they're, they're kind enough to share the, the plans with us. Uh, they were placed on the ground, however, uh, in the parking lot of the, the park, and it was very difficult to see the details. Um, however, there, there were two versions that were shared with us, and it wasn't clear what the eventual plan would be. So uh, and there were still open questions regarding parking, street markings and signage, modifications to park at entrance, et cetera. So the park has the feeling of being an experiment. Um, and, this, and if this is an experiment, will this model be applied to other community parks in Princeton? If not, then what would be the benefits of having a one-off process and infrastructure just for Hilltop Park? Uh, shouldn't we be thinking more broadly and try to find a solution that proves all the athletic fields located in Princeton's community parks? Uh, wouldn't we be then leveraging our resources, you know, already in place? Um, the, the way I see it, the current proposal is a loss win. It's a loss of open space for, for the community and a win for organizations that have special interests. Um, uh, my hope is that we find a win-win scenario and we can do this in a more thoughtful way. Uh, given the flux of the plans, I agree with what's been proposed that we take a step back to allow the town council to conduct a more focused analysis to consider risks and benefits and possibly develop standards and or guidelines for all Princeton community parks by invent, uh, inviting experts to address our concerns regarding park 
parking, traffic, environmental impact, et cetera. Uh, since this is, this is the first of its kind uh, in, the, in our community and we have uh, you know, a new mayor and, a new, and new council members, it makes sense that, we, that there are many unanswered questions that none of us could have anticipated when this project was originally proposed. So it, it makes sense to take a fresh look at this in a more holistic and comprehensive approach. So again, I wanna thank you for allowing me to speak. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, this is Jeff Bergman. I'm, I live at 300 Dodds Lane. Um, I really appreciate what other people have said already. I wanted to talk about Hilltop Park. Um, the letters that were read um, were tremendous. Um, and I feel the same way and, and much of my concerns um, are in the letter to the editor that I wrote to Planet Princeton. Uh, and you can read that if you, if you go there, if you haven't already. Um, I'm concerned um, on a couple of issues. First, I went back to try to look at the minutes. Uh, I understand this is being driven mostly through the rec department and the minutes are very sp sparse. Um, I, I wanted to find out, number one, if there are any video transcripts of those meetings so, um, so I can understand what was meant by discussion was held um, and, and things of that nature. So I, you can't get a feeling of what was going on in the meeting from, from the very sparse minutes that, um, that were written. Um, the other thing is um, I'd like to know, you know where you are in the process of determining what type of synthetic field you would choose because we can't really um, come up with, with uh, great uh, reasons or you know, if you're using crumb fill versus a different kind of fill, we don't know that yet and we don't know what the cost will be. And frankly, uh, I'm against synthetic turf on any level. And I agree with the other, um, the other speakers that the council, the, the full town council should step back and conduct a review of this. So basically those three concerns, I'd like to know if there are video minutes, um, whether the town can hold a uh, special meeting having to do with this. And, um, and I forget the third, but uh, this is, this is a, would make Princeton a very different place than it is today to have synthetic turf on, on our fields. It's not what we um, want to be as a town, I don't think. Um, we're a sustainable town. And uh, I think that we can do better with our field maintenance perhaps to take care of things like drainage and, and playability. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, you're next. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Johnson and I live at 12 Bird Drive. Thank you for the opportunity to share my perspective on the issue of installing artificial turf at Hilltop Park or anywhere else in Princeton. I'm the father of a very active elementary school, school age child and very much appreciate the value that organized sports provide in terms of physical fitness, socialization and building confidence. I understand that there are competing needs and interests for Princeton's limited open space resources and trying to balance these interests is a challenging needle to thread. Taking a macro view, I hope that there will be an opportunity for, for a robust deep dive about all of the details and impacts of an artificial turf. It seems, like, seems that talking about details of how to implement the synthetic turf field might be premature without having a public dialogue about the needs and competing views. As a quick aside, I wanna note my appreciation for the dialogue that I have just started with Ben, Evan, Deanna, Jim, and Taylor. They have been very courteous and responsive in my dealings with them starting early, earlier this month. That said, I'm concerned about the environmental impacts, long-term health concerns, unanticipated long-term costs, especially with our current budget shortfall, and loss of natural space and time of use for the densely populated communities surrounding the park. 
It seems that the issue about artificial turf and field lighting pops up every few years and tends to spur active conversations in the community. This time it seems is no exception. Just take a look at the Hilltop Park section on next door and there are literally hundreds of comments and replies on the Hilltop Park project in a little over a week. I think a fair reading of those comments shows that most are not in favor of having artificial turf in Princeton. Overall, it seems people are eager to talk about this issue. That's been one of my challenges over the past couple of weeks. What is the best forum for people to be heard by town officials? We, we've seen letters in the papers, conversations on next door, and attendance at tonight's and last, the last council meeting. I'm glad to hear confirmation of a joint recreation and environmental commission meeting in mid-April. As we heard earlier tonight, however, there's been confusion and late stage changes about which meetings are happening or not and which forum is best in order to hear citizens' concerns. So I'd like to ask tonight if the council would be willing to call a dedicated hearing on the topic. Let's discuss whether or not Princeton is the kind of community for which the installation of artificial turf fields is the best option to provide athletic space, shared open natural spaces for residents, and respect the environment overall. Maybe there are better ideas to take advantage of the Mercer at Play funds that make more sense in the context of the master plan. Based on what I've seen, such a dedicated forum would be well received and well attended. Thank you for considering this request. Thank you. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Mika Kelly, um, and I live at One Lawrence in Princeton. Um, and I would just like to say that uh, it would be so awesome if um, everyone talking about the soccer field would come to a PMA meeting because we would love to redirect this energy towards the community center. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that that uh, plug got in to um, the public comment section um, because I think, I'm, you know, the language around like, what do we want Princeton to be? Um, I think a lot of people in Princeton would love Princeton to be a place that, uh, De devoted a specific um, building, um, specific resources altogether to make, uh, you know, make this um, make this town um, a safe and beautiful and uh, lovely place to live for everybody uh, and not just certain people. Thank you. Thank you. Maria. Good evening. Um, I would like to add um, my uh, support to the uh, concept of, of the community center and remind council that um, uh, that this is something that has been part of the master plan forever. Um, uh, the creation of a, of a community center. Uh, I will read from from the master uh, from the master plan. The community center in one or more facilities for our senior citizens, young people, and the community at large has been identified as a pressing community need. As the community approaches build out, it should take necessary steps to preserve potential community center sites. So clearly, I think this was written, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in 1996. Uh, so <laughs> uh, it, uh, the conditions continue to be the same and even more uh, more urgent uh, today. Um, and I would like to invite uh, one of the council men members to please be part of this task force and help us make this happen. Um, so uh, um, on behalf of, the, of our group, I'm extending an invitation to, uh, to any of you who would like to be part of this exciting project. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just a reminder, as the public, if you come in and just please say your full name and address, that'd be great. Uh, Catherine, I think is next. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm a bit confused about Zoom. Um, I've got a lot of, of things that I wanted to ask you. I've could, you just, could you just state your full name and address and then start? Oh, I'm sorry. My full name is Catherine Iref, but my nickname is Lindy Iref. 
And I've always been known by everybody in town as Lindy Ira. I'm a bit surprised when I sign a check and it's not Lindy. <laughs> um, I live on Dodds Lane. And when I read the letters in the town topics two weeks ago, I was appalled that I didn't know anything about this going on at all. And of course, during COVID, I really have stayed in my house an awful lot and I haven't really been joining in on Zoom because I find it difficult to even work out how to work it. Um, but to get on with my reasoning, um, I talked to various people in my neighborhood and I decided that we should um, get in touch with as many people as possible. And on Sunday, yesterday, um, we sent out a letter to everybody on our calling list. And today I've already had 30 people respond that they want to support uh, Hilltop Park with what they're doing. Um, back in 08, um, we had a Northeast Residents Association, which was very active. And um, the Recreation Department decided that the best thing that they could do for the town was to turn the field that is called the general purpose field into turf. And so we had many meetings. Um, it was quite expensive. We all paid at that time. That, that uh, organization went back to when um, the, the uh, I think probably it was the state um, wanted to drive a road right through from 206, um, from uh, Route 1 uh, through to Hewn and to the shopping centre and to 206. And that's when that organisation started. It was then very involved with the Barbara Smoyer Park, which is our local park. And in 08, um, they wanted this turf field and we turned it down for all the reasons that are being suggested at the moment. It's just not the right sort of place for Princeton. And um, it would, we just think it's appalling that that neighborhood not only has a skate park taking a lot of space out of it, but there'll be a drive through for cars to drop kids off. Um, and where are those local children going to be able to meet their friends and play? And if there's a uh, synthetic turf field, that can be used until midnight, I suppose. So I don't know what time it would shut down, but what are those neighbors going to endure? And I believe you have plans for a new building up there. And I know there's a water problem, but my next thing is, has the health department had anything to do with this whole um, situation? Because um, when it's all dug up, which will be huge to do whatever you have to do, and I believe there's a big catchment basin there, but my worries are the filaments that come off this turf and around areas like goalposts, there's very heavy wear and children inhale these filaments. They get them in their uh, injuries. It's hard. They hit their heads badly. Uh, concussions are worse. Everything that you read about it for children just doesn't seem acceptable and not for adults either. But the filaments are going to work their way into the water system and it's said to be clean, but it will have filaments in it. That water goes down through, um, there's a pumping station and that cliff on um, Bun Drive, just below the village. I walked all the way through there um, probably in 012 with Greg O'Neill because I was on the Shade Tree Commission. And at that time, Governor's Lane was worried. And then there's an, another pumping station um, onto Hume Road. And I presume the water then goes down to Meadow Road. I don't know where it goes next. Lindy, can I, can I just remind you of the, the three minute okay. limit? So if well, you let could me just up. say one more thing. Oh, sure. That's going to be our drinking water. It leads it goes all the way along the canal and then it's processed and that is Princeton's drinking water and I worry about mesothelioma which comes from asbestos but it could come from these filaments 
And I worry about 20 and 40 years down the road if this is the next asbestos problem, mesothelioma. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Do we have other members of the public that wish to talk about anything that's not on the agenda for tonight? All right, I don't, don't see any other hands raised, so we'll close the, uh, the public comment for items not on the agenda. And the next section is public comments or questions of ordinance adoption. Uh, and there's three ordinances on the agenda, but I just wanna remind people if you weren't here for the very beginning of the meeting, that number two, ordinance 20-2105 um, has been pulled off the agenda. That's the bank parking ordinance. Um, we just needed to give the planning board time to, uh, to review that and give us a report on that. So there'll be two, uh, two ordinances uh, tonight. Uh, Eve, I'm sorry. Mark, I'm sorry, I'm getting a text, a text from uh, Veronica that she has her hand raised um, and wanted to make a, a comment, not on the agenda. Okay, we, we can go back to that, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Mark. I want to thank, uh, my name is Veronica olivares Weber, and I live on 26 Edward Place. I would like to thank Councilwoman Fraga for reading our letter, and I'm here speaking on behalf of the, um, of the letter uh, for the Interfaith co Coalition of Princeton residents. Uh, our plan was to read the letter together, but you know, I, I, you know I'm so grateful that Leticia did. But I would like to add to this, you know, the community center will benefit or, uh, or, sm or a small town. There is so many studies that it talks about, you know, how will it benefit in so many other ways, in addition to what is on our letter. Uh, keep adolescents safe, pro provide a meeting space. And one of the things that we don't want is to overlap with services. So I think there is a, a little bit of, you know, things that we mentioned in the letter, but we don't wanna, you know, overlap with the services that or partners or any organizations are already, you know, services that they're providing, but to partner with them to kind of like be the meeting place and also be the, you know, the the ones who, who will kind of like connect this, you know, uh, maybe help with this gap with some sometimes, there is all these services providers that may not, people don't know exactly where to go because there is, you know, there is some, a lot of miscommunication. And in addition to that, I would like to talk about, you know, this will also help us in usually in a small towns with busy parents like, like our town and few entertainment options. Adolescents don't have a place to go, right? So this will keep, you know, or juvenile or youth busy, you know, occupied with other things and focus on, you know, in, in helping in the community. I will also like to mention that we have over 185 signatures at the moment and they're continue coming. And um, I would like to, you know, to add the support of council and mayor for the community center and uh, that we have been talking for so many years, like Maria Juega, Juega mentioned. And I would like to also, like Mika say, invite my neighbors who are so worried about whether they want turf of, you know, uh, grass that is natural to come and join us for other kind of efforts that will really help our neighbors uh, who are really sometimes struggling. Uh, and thank you to any, any, anybody, everybody. Sorry, I, I would try to say so much at the same time that I kind of got mixed, but I thank you everybody for your support. Thank you. All right, let me just make sure. There's no other hands raised, but I just wanna make sure there's nobody else in the public that's attempting to raise their hand. Okay, all right, let's go back to the, uh, all right, so we're gonna close the public comments for items not on the agenda again, and reopen the public comments or questions on ordinance adoption. The two ordinances that we have public hearings on tonight are ordinance 20-2104, an ordinance authorizing lease for the use of Community Park South tennis facility. And there's ordinance 2021-06, an ordinance by the municipality of Princeton, continuing the temporary relaxation or suspension of certain regulations to enable local businesses to operate in compliance with COVID-19 restrictions. 
So is there anyone from the public that wish to speak on either one of those? Mark, we should probably take one at a time. Yeah, well, okay. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, does someone on council want to move the, uh, the first order? Okay, David was the quickest. Dwayne, yeah, I'm sorry, Dwayne hasn't got a second in a while, so I got I got it. I've been kind of slow at the draw there, so. Okay, so ordinance 20, 2104, authorizing the lease of Community Park South tennis facility. Any, uh, any public comment on that? Any council questions on that? Okay, we'll call vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, could you call the roll? Okay. Um, Ms. Pearl Lamros? Yes. Ms. Niedergang? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. Mr. Williamson? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Okay. The next one was Ordinance 202106. Ordinance by Ms. Valley of Princeton continuing the temporary relaxation or suspension of certain regulations to enable local businesses to operate in compliance with COVID-19 restrictions. Is there a motion on that? Leticia and Michelle with the second. Any public questions or comments on that ordinance introduction? On that ordinance hearing? Seeing and hearing none. Any council comments or questions? Seeing none. Oh, sorry, Eve. All right. I, I just have to say once again, uh, thanks to our staff and uh, to Michelle uh, for really uh, spearheading efforts with uh, with the business community. And thanks to our staff for doing such a great job of, you know, being flexible under these really difficult times and, you know, really has made a difference. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can we uh, have the roll call vote on that, please? Ms. Carl Lambros? Yes. Ms. Niedergang? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. Mr. Williamson? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Okay, thank you. Next, we're going to ordinance introduction. And again, if you weren't here for the beginning of the meeting, the first ordinance under ordinance introduction, ordinance 202108. An ordinance concerning salaries and compensation of certain personnel of municipality of Princeton uh, is being pulled just because the wrong copy of that ordinance was put in the agenda package by mistake. So that'll be handled at a future council meeting. So um, we do have the ordinance introduction on ordinance 2021-09, an ordinance by the municipality of Princeton regarding off-street parking requirements for changes in use and amending chapter 10B, land use, of the Code of the Township of Princeton, New Jersey, 1968, and Chapter 17A, Land Use, of the Code of the Borough of Princeton, New Jersey, 1974. The public hearing will be on April 12, 2021. Uh, Michelle. Well, I'd like to make a motion, um, and I'd also might like to make a comment, but maybe we'll get a second first. And sure, is there a second on the motion? Eve, thank you very much. Thank you. I just like to thank. Well, first of all, well, the staff. I mean, uh, 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 Derek and um, and Tr Trishka, our, our municipal attorney, for moving this along very quickly. Uh, this was just first presented to the Economic Development Committee um, less than a month ago, um, and it's already moved to a, a ordinance introduction. Uh, this is really an essential piece to helping um, ease restrictions. Um, and, and, you know, lift some barriers of entry for, for businesses to, um, to, to locate change of use, um, uh, you know, locate here, fill the vacancies, and so on. So um, I just want to thank everybody for their expeditious work on this. Thank you, Michelle. Any other council comments or questions? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Can we do the roll call uh, vote on this, please? Sure. Ms. Pearl Lambros? Yes. Ms. Niedergang? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. Mr. Williamson? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Okay, now we'll go to resolutions. 21-100, resolution of the mayor and council of Princeton determining the form and other details of 
$9,540,000 general obligation refunding bonds, series 2021, consisting of 3,840,000 general improvement refunding bonds and 5,700,000 parking utility refunding bonds. Uh, Mark or Bob, any commentary on this? Actually, Sam, so, you, you know, this want to uh, get Mark. Yeah, She's just quickly, to... this is the this is related to the bond ordinance that was previously before council. Uh, what the assembly does is just puts the bond ordinance for refunding um, in the proper forms needed for the refunding. And again, this will show some significant savings in our um, parking utility. I'll move it. I'm sorry, David. That was I'll moved. Move yeah. Okay, David moved it. Michelle's seconding. Any council uh, questions or comments? If Thank not, you, all... Sandy. <laughs> all in favor say aye. 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 That's everyone. 21101 resolution professional services contract environmental attorney services not to exceed $50,000. One of our administrators wanna. Uh, this is a contract, um, as you know, um, we have engaged John Cagnelli to be our environmental attorney in reference to uh, our violation at River Road. This contract is a 2000, it's actually 2020 and 21 contract for professional services. Uh, the contract will pay for uh, the services at the end of 2020, as you know, uh, was working with Chubb um, to get our um, our claim approved by Club Chubb. Chubb has denied our claim. Uh, he is now in the process of reviewing, provide counsel with an analysis of whether we should move forward with a claim against um, or um, non-payment of the claim. Um, he will provide that to counsel shortly. So the majority of this is to pay those costs that were um, incurred at the end of 2020. Um, and then calls for uh, the additional work um, to do the analysis of whether or not we should um, make a claim against each other. Thank you. Any questions on that? Is there a motion? Dwayne's got that one. Is there a second? Eve, thank you very much. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. 21-102. Resolution authorizing the installation of a monitoring well on an unimproved municipal right of way between block 805 lot one and block 804 lot seven located west of US Route 206 and north of Hillside Avenue. Would someone from staff comment on that? Sure, Mayor. Um, this was a request from a licensed site remediation professional um, who is investigating groundwater contamination uh, related to the Petro oil site. Um, and they have asked for permission to put this monitoring well on our unimproved right of way. Um, that's probably easier to think of. It's the uh, land that's just north north of the um, tire store. So you've got uh, across the street would be um, the Bottle King. And then, so it's kind of in that general area. And so they would install the monitoring well and then they would have access to uh, take groundwater samples from that. Thank you, Deanna. Eve? Yeah, and I just have a quick follow-up uh, question for that. Is, are there other wells on the property? But like, well, I'm curious about what are the conditions for which they want to be in this particular area rather than on their property? And will there be additional wells to monitor? Is this the only one and, and why there? Um, Based on the information that they provided, I think that they, they have a concern or they need to determine if there is a spread um, and, and that's why they're doing it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there a motion on this one? Eve, thank you very much. Is there a second? 
Mr. David, thank you. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, that's everybody. Um, sorry, uh, 21103, resolution authorizing the award of construction contract to Black Rock Enterprises, LLC for the 2021 Pathways Project in an amount not to exceed $264,000. $256,000. Deanna, is this something you would comment on also? Sure, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so this is a contract to make some much needed repairs to our asphalt pathways. Um, in this case, uh, included in this contract is the J Johnson Trolley Pathway from Elm over to Johnson Park School. Um, we also are working on uh, Mountain Avenue from Great Road to Quarry um, on Johnson Trolley. Just to backtrack a little bit, we are replacing to its existing width, which um, once you scrape back some of the soils, actually eight foot wide. Um, Mountain Avenue, we are looking to widen the existing five to six foot wide pathway to eight to 10 feet, um, where, wherever we can po possibly get to 10 feet, that's what we are shooting for. And then um, the third major pathway section is um, a section of asphalt so uh, sidewalk on Macomb Road in the Campbell Woods neighborhood. Um, and then the fourth portion of work is to repair cracks on the pathway on Cherry Hill from 206 up um, towards Andrews and Foulet. Um, and so that, that is the work under this contract. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion on it? David, is there a second? Michelle, thank you. All in favor? Mark, I, I have a I'd question. Like to make a comment as well. Oh, sorry. Um, which is that um, this uh, bid came in actually quite a bit under the uh, engineering department's estimate. So um, always a great thing to get work done less expensively than we expect. Um, I emailed Dan a little earlier today to see if there are any other side paths that need work that we might be able to add into the contract um, since it came in so low. And um, Deanna, I don't know if you want to get specific about that, but. Sure. I mean, we do have some additional work that we need to do around CP North and CP South. Um, those I think are kind of the next priority. And so we did have a contingency in our contract um, that if we don't need to use it for the, um, the s sections that I stated, that there is the possibility that we might be able to add in a little bit of work at the two parks um, to just maximize the usage of the contractor when he's in town. But I may have to arm wrestle the other members of the finance committee to get them to was to spend money. Well, luckily that's already in the contract. So in, instead of giving you money back, like I have been doing, uh, we'll just fully utilize it. <laughs> okay. Eve. That, that sounds like a bad advertisement, Deanna, like save money now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a quick follow-up question uh, about Mountain Ave. Um, if you're expanding um, the amount of pavement uh, have we looked into uh, stormwater runoff implications from that? I know it's not that, uh, you know, from six to eight feet or five to eight feet, but just wondering if that's been looked at as a possible issue. Um, well, with municipal development, I think our threshold is higher and we don't hit that threshold for stormwater management. And there are provisions within the stormwater rules about linear developments for pathways. Mm -hmm. So not at this time. Okay. And do you personally anticipate knowing the geology a little bit? Do you, you don't anticipate any, I'm not trying to put you on the spot too much, but you don't anticipate any issues from that? 
No, it's, uh, I mean, more than anything, it's the existing development with the, the trees that we have in the area that we're being sensitive, you know, trying to strike the balance of all the, the needs between the, uh, the pathway as well as the, um, the urban forest. So are we taking down trees to build the pathway? Uh, not, no, no, not necessarily. We are limbing trees. Um, we have had the arborist take a look at the corridors and um, I think he is making some, he is doing some removals, say for ash trees, um, some non-native species, that type of things, but it's not, it's not removals to accommodate what we're doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All in favor, please. Uh, wait a minute. Did we, yeah, all in favor, please say that. Aye. Aye. Um, next one, 21104, resolution of the mayor and council of Princeton authorizing the award of a contract to Sunset Creations for the Princeton Spring 2021 planting project in the amount of $34,900, which is the planting of about 43 trees scattered around town. Question, yeah, Michelle. Yeah, I'll make a I just wanted to make a motion. Thank you so much. Is there a second? Eve seconded. Any questions? Please say aye. Aye. Okay. Resol uh, 21105, resolution approving a contract with Custom Care Services, Inc. for mowing services and not to exceed $30,241.52. Any comment or question on that? Yeah, Leticia. Uh, I had a question and then I'll be happy to move it forward. And actually would rec uh, suggest moving both it looks like it's the same uh, service provide, uh, same contractor providing the service 105 and 106. Uh, but I just had a question as to whether this was something that went out to bid. I'm assuming it did, but I just wanted to confirm that. Look, that is correct that it did go out bid. Let me just so no one. Yes, the answer is yes. Okay, and, and the reason I ask that, I, I have brought this up, uh, question up before, but I want to uh, again suggest and, and ask if it's something that we can consider in the future is for uh, the smaller um, contracts amounts, if we can consider uh, specifically reaching out to minority and or women owned businesses, ideally if there's local contractors available to, to provide the services, if we, if we could consider uh, doing that. And I, I will ju jump in and say, I think that we've done some yeah. uh, work to do outreach to the local vendors to coach them in how to go after municipal contracts. And I think that that's an important companion piece, you know, not just to make them aware that a contract is being bid, but how you know, to. give some, yeah, could give some uh, guidance on how best yeah. to proceed. And, and that would be great if we could promote that, that that's available. That's, uh, you know, for someone who may be interested, the, that that would be available in as far as the how to. And David, where, where would those services come from? What, what organization would... I honestly don't remember. I just remember hearing about doing that kind of outreach. Um, hmm. We can we can ask Liz. She she'll probably remember more about it. I, I think we can agree that we can. It, it's a great goal, and we should do it. I know we've done it to some extent in the past, but we can definitely look into doing it again this year. And we have between all the different departments and everything. I, I think we have outreach people in a couple different departments now. So I think that we have mechanism to make sure that we can reach a pretty wide audience on this because I think it's very important that we spend as much money much money that we raise in our community that we can yeah right? we're, we're developing and just for this. Some, oh I just want to clarify this was bid out previously this is an extension of a contract that was bid it's not it has been bid for this it's an extension of a contract that was previously bid 
Okay. And, and I just wanted to put it out there, something that would still as like for us to consider moving forward. But uh, aside from that, I'd be happy to move it. I, I, I'll be happy to second. I just want to piggyback that with our sustainable landscaping project, we're establishing relationships with more local landscapers and, and Leticia that and David, I would love to leverage those connections to uh, teach them how to, uh, you know, how to apply for contracts like this. That would be great. Thank you. Excuse me, Mayor Frieda, I just want to confirm, are we moving 105 and 106 together then? I was yeah, I just I was just about to ask Leticia. That, that's what I propose. Thank you. I just want to make sure. And Eve, you are okay with seconding for both. Let's do it. Thank you very much. Okay, we're moving both. All in favor, please. Aye. Aye. Or aye. Wave a hand or something. Aye, okay. aye, twice. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> aye, aye, sir. Aye, sir. <laughs> 21107, resolution authorizing the award of a contract to Edmonds Gov Tech System for tax and sewer collection in the amount of $52,758.81 for the first year and years two through five, $20,950 annually. I think Sandy had, Sandy, did you wanna say anything about this? Do you think commented on it last meeting? But. Um, sure, I can. Um, so our software that we use for tax and, and uh, sewer collection has been failing. Um, the the gentleman who owned the owned the company sold it. The support's not there. Um, one of the problems that we have is because we build taxes and sewer together. Not just anyone can accommodate this. So Edmonds and Associates is used primarily, probably by about ninety percent of the companies or of the municipalities in New Jersey. So we're really confident that they can um, buy the service that we need. And we're, we're looking to do this, get this contract awarded now so that we can make this transition before we uh, do our next round of tax bills, which will be over the summer. Thank you, Sandy. Okay, does someone wanna move that? Wayne moved it, second. Thank you, Michelle. Any, any other council questions or comments? Seeing none, please say aye or wave your hand, do something so we know. Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank 21, you. 2108 resolution authorizing a contract um, of, to relevation coach. Sorry, I lost my place for a second. To relevation coaching services for coaching services for municipal staff in an amount not to exceed $18,000. I'll move it. Uh, Eve. Um, I would be happy to move it, but I thought Mark and I had a bit of a conversation about this today, and I thought perhaps he could provide a little context because it was a very uh, persuasive uh, conversation. Okay, let me just, was there, I'm sorry, was there a second? David, thank you. Go ahead, Mark, sorry. Thank you. Um, the Revelation Coaching Services is a service that we provide. Um, it provides um, some coaching services, both to our employees and their supervisors. Um, what this allows us to do is um, instead of going, uh, a lot of times you'll go right to a kind of disciplinary action. It allows us to work with a coaching services, people to, to um, staff to work together more efficiently and more effectively. Um, and what we do is identify where there's problem areas or concerns in the department. We provide them the necessary training and skills that allow them to work well with each other, um, help their supervisor manage that individual um, a, a lot better. It's a service that's um, worth uh, the, the dollar amounts that you see here. Um, if you look at this from this perspective, the money that we're spending here um, is far less than what it would cost us and the time and energy spent on disciplinary actions, my time, the time, um, or potential lawsuits. Um, it is a good investment in our employees um, and I think it's a great service. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Actually, there's a hand up in the public. Yeah, I was just gonna say that, but Patricia Soul has her hand up. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. All right, that's okay. Thank you, Dave.
Patty, can you unmute yourself and then just say okay. your full name and address? No, Pat Patricia Saul, 79 Linden Lane. Um, I just wanted to um, applaud what Letitia said about giving the business to you know local businesses and to minority owned businesses and women owned businesses. But you said for the smaller jobs and I say it should be for every job. So I just wanted to say, you know, let's go for it. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Patty. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Patty. Good reminder. Okay, we're we were about to vote on the uh, the resolution twenty one one zero eight. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. 21109, resolution in support of the New Jersey Department of Transportation's preliminary preferred alternate to improve pedestrian safety at the Nassau Street, New Jersey State Highway 27 slash Witherspoon Street intersection by replacing the traffic signal equipment, implementing an exclusive pedestrian signal phase and installing curb extensions. So Deanna, can you tell us which things we questioned last time that they agreed to and which things they did not? I can do that. Let me just pull up the agenda. So um, back in February, um, I brought the preliminary preferred alternative to council as part of uh, a Witherspoon Street presentation and um, at the time we had a discussion and there were four items for follow-up from the meeting and bear with me as I find it on the council agenda. The, the drawings on page 205 of 280. Thank you, that's helpful. <laughs> okay, so yes, yeah, so um, in the discussion, in my memo starting on 203, um, there were a variety of questions. Um, one was related to how the traffic signal will operate um, and when pedestrians will be able to cross um, at Witherspoon Street. And so what we found from the DOT's consultant is that pedestrians will be prohibited from crossing Witherspoon Street when um, Nassau has the green light, the intersection is being set up with the exclusive pedestrian phase. And so that is the time when, the, when pedestrians can cross in all directions. At all other times, um, motor vehicles will have the only right to move through the intersection. Uh, the second question that was brought up was, uh, will it be visually clear to drivers that Nassau southbound has um, been formalized in um, a straight direction and that um, the right turn lane has been removed and replaced with a curb extension. And um, DOT is um, going to be signing and striping the loading area that currently exists in that area. And um, they are confident that that will make it visually clear to drivers that that is not an area to pull into um, when making a right turn on to Witherspoon Street. Third question is, does the new signal timing due to the curb extensions and one-way Witherspoon movement reduce the cues that will be created by taking away that right turn lane? Um, and what uh, DOT's consultant advised is that um, the existing right turn lane is only long enough for about two vehicles. And um, if you already had um, some vehicles going straight through on Nassau Street, um, that vehicles couldn't even enter into that turn lane. So they feel that removing the right turn lane doesn't have an, a, a major impact with the way that the, the signal functions now. And so um, by taking away that right turn lane, it wasn't providing much to the signal timing and it will not have that much of an impact um, 
on the new signal timing. Um, and then let's see, the final question is, would DOT consider a pilot program to temporarily install the curb extensions? And um, DOT does not participate in pilot programs, unfortunately. So th those were the questions that had come up. Um, the historic preservation officer has also been in contact with DOT's consultant to uh, review some sample pictures of what the curb extensions may look like. Um, but uh, in essence, I think everybody is comfortable with the preferred alternative, and we will just be working through the details of design as they move ahead with their project. I thought the Historic Preservation Commission actually voted to recommend that the curb extensions on the um, north side of uh, Nassau Street not be installed. Sorry, I, I, State Historic Preservation has advised that safety is a priority at the intersection and that they do not have objections to curb bump outs, um, curb extensions being used to uh, create a safer intersection for all users. Okay, all right, sorry. So now I know which historic preservation was. Our local historic preservation. Yes, our local like historic preservation has had issues with curb extensions. That, that is um, something the engineering department has come across in the past with them. Okay, thank you, Deanna. Mm -hmm. Michelle, did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. Just, Deanna, thank you for that. I just, I, I think that we said that it, the parking space uh, allocation was gonna stay neutral. We weren't losing or adding any there on Nassau Street. I just wanna verify Correct. that. Correct, yes. Thank you, thank you very much, mm -hmm. great. Mayor, there's a hand up in the public again. Yep, oh, okay. Thank you, David. Veronica, if you want to unmute yourself and then just introduce yourself. Actually, I think I may I pressed by mistake, so I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, no problem. That that was quick. Thank you. Okay. Any um any any council comments or questions on the uh, DOT's recommendation. Okay, does someone want to move this then? Okay, Michelle was quick. Eve, you, I mean, uh, Mia, sorry, Mia can second it. All in favor, please say Aye. yes or wave. Aye. Aye. Okay, that's everybody. Okay, consent agenda is up. If uh, no one has any specific questions on any single item in the consent agenda, somebody could move the entire consent agenda. Eve. I move the consent agenda. Thank you. Michelle has a second. Uh, all in favor, please say yes. Aye. Yes. Aye. Okay. Aye. That's everyone. David? Move to Good adjourn. <laughs> there we go. Move to adjourn. It's been seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. We got through a lot. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Great night, everyone. Night, everyone. Night. Dawn, did you get the second on that one? No, I was just going to ask that. Thank you, Eve. I, I think it was Michelle. <laughs> okay. Right. And thank you. Um, and just real quick, um, Mia and Dwayne, do you know what you want for tomorrow? 